Good morning, everyone. We're going to call a meeting of the Carson City Board of Supervisors to order. Today is Thursday, May 17th, 2018. It is just 8.30 a.m. We're in the Sierra, Sierra Room at the Community Center at 851 East William Street. We're also streaming on the Internet. And if you have uh, cable TV, we're on the municipal channel on cable TV. Uh, could we have a roll call, please, for the record? Good morning, Supervisor Bowd. Supervisor Bonkowski. Supervisor Bagwell. Here. Supervisor Barrett. Here. Mayor Crow. Here. Of Thank court. you very much, Sue. Mm -hmm. um, can we call on our good friend Louis Locke from the Fountainheads Foursquare to get us started today? Is Louis. Morning, Louis. How are you? Good. Thank you. Get us going on the right foot today. All right. Let's pray. All right. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon the people of Carson City. We ask for wisdom for our supervisors, blessing for them also and on their families. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll now move on to item number five, public comment. This is a time uh, uh, to comment on any, discuss any topic that's relevant to or within the authority of this public body. We also take public comment where it's appropriate, and it usually is on each of the agenda items we go through. Anybody on public comment? Come on up. Come on. Good morning, Mayor Crow, Supervisors. My name is Ken Mullen. I'm the new airport manager at the Carson City Airport. I want to thank you for the opportunity to Did come. Did you fly in here this morning? <laughs> Flew under the radar, sir. All right, all right, all right, Ken. <laughs> I want to just have the opportunity to uh, come to the Board of Supervisors and thank you guys all for the opportunity to meet with you. I've, I've met with the City Manager and Assistant City Manager already and each of you individually, and I really appreciate that opportunity. And one thing that I've, I've captured during that time is I wanted to quickly talk about um, two events that we have coming up. We have the open house for the airport that is on June 23rd at, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. that day. And the theme of the uh, event is to invite community youth to come and experience aviation and uh, get their, their sights set on future career opportunities. As we know, <clears throat> there's a big demand for pilots and mechanics and aerospace engineers coming up and so we want to incite and excite our youth about that opportunity. The other one is um, I've been on board since March 22nd and we're in the middle of a master plan and we have a meeting coming up on June 27th at 2600 East College Parkway and I would like to invite the city uh, leaders, board of supervisors, mayor and uh, other departments to come to that um, meeting and to see what's going on in the master plan and where we're at and what our progress is. <clears throat> but I have three mandates that was given to me by the, uh, the uh, airport authority. And one is safety and security of the airport. Second is our day-to-day -day operations. And third is business development. And in my discussions with uh, the Board of Supervisors and other parties, everybody has kind of had the same theme, that they look at the airport as a shared community asset and that it is an underutilized asset in the community. And so I want to start that conversation with our master plan, with our open house, and how do we expand that opportunity in the community. And so as a shared asset, I look for the city and the state uh, to come together and see how we can guide this forward through our master planning process. So I want to thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful day. Well, Ken, thank you for, for the update. And 
while we're all here, why don't you give us a little update on your background? So, just tell us. <clears throat> take take a minute and brag. Well, uh, I'll be brief. I was born in 1959. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I, my family moved to Sparks, Nevada in 1976. I was a senior in high school. And I graduated from Reed High School. Two weeks out of high school, I enlisted in the United States Army, and I was an air traffic controller. Uh, I was discharged honorably in June of 1981. And then Ronald Reagan provided the opportunity for uh, my career as an air traffic controller by uh, firing 12,000 PACO controllers. <laughs> so I, I always try to counsel youth to leave room for opportunity in life. Don't plan for everything. Um, after I retired, uh, uh, excuse me, after I got hired by the FAA, I spent uh, the next 27 years as a controller, of which my first five were at Reno. Then I moved to Denver, Colorado and worked at Denver Stapleton. And then I had the opportunity to move back um, as the uh, quality assurance and training officer for the uh, FAA tower at Reno. And then I spent the remainder of my career till 2009 as a controller at Reno. And I worked this airspace over Carson City as well as Menden, Douglas County and um, out, out to the east, uh, out towards Spanish Springs or Silver Springs and Fallon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I retired in 2009 and I took a job as a contractor working for a company called Washington Consulting Group and went to Baghdad, Iraq, where I trained Iraqi air traffic controllers for a year. And then when I came back, I got hired by the airport authority at Reno Tahoe and I've been there for the last seven years until this opportunity arose here at Carson. Thanks, Ken. It's an impressive background, so I want to <coughs> talk a little bit about yourself there. That's good. Okay, got anything? Well, I'd love for everybody to come out to our event. And have, we uh, heard from the, have you heard from the Navy yet, by the way? <laughs> Boy, I, I've been on the Navy's uh, coattails trying to get them uh, together, and we're moving in the right direction, but we don't have a firm commitment yet. Um, but uh, I figure if enough whining uh, and arm twisting, I think we can make something happen. All right, good. Thanks. Thanks very much. All right, you bet. All right. Who else has got? Oh, Madam President, come on up. How are you doing? For the record, Stephanie Tyler representing AT&T Nevada. Um, glad to make a couple of comments regarding a staff item that you're going to hear a little bit more about, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, supervisors. Uh, I wanted to just take a second and talk a little bit about a wonderful new technology that is coming to this region. Um, it is called small cells. And basically it allows for connectivity in congested areas and quite frankly, the incredible job that this uh, board has done with the downtown redevelopment area, I'm hoping will become one of those areas. Um, and uh, what we're looking at is deploying this technology uh, where basically it allows for really exciting things like connected car and that kind of stuff that the that uh, those sort of items that the governor has has uh, also in, incited uh, within our economic development efforts here in in the state. We've had some really great initial discussions with staff on this item. Um, they are working on this, I think, uh, in in a very broad. Uh, intelligent way, working on a regional basis, so talking with the cities of Reno and Sparks and their efforts. And um, as the mayor and a number of other supervisors know, I am a Carson City resident, and I want to ensure that, that Carson City has its um, definite fair, of, fair share of that investment opportunity. So again, we're just in the preliminary stages. Uh, we will be coming back in front of this board, I'm sure, uh, with, a, with a, a final, what we call master attachment agreement that hopefully will incite this um, investment by all the providers uh, to ensure that uh, Carson City remains connected. And there's a, there's a couple of really great uh, applications that I just want to touch on very quickly. Um, you might have heard of FirstNet, which is a first responder uh, network that finally Congress uh, uh, put in place a number, uh, a couple of years ago that again will give our first responders the connectivity that they need. This small cell system will work hand in glove with that. So again, lots of important overreaching public policy issues, um, including some of the great redevelopment uh, efforts, again, that, that, that you've done and um, economic development uh, efforts that this 
uh, board has participated in. So anyway, just wanted to, to kind of kick off the discussion and, and tell you that we're working closely with staff and appreciate your support going forward on this important initiative. Thanks, Stephanie. And thanks for all you do for, for Carson you. City. You're always around. I am around. I know you live here, but you're always around. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Steph. All right. I, I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anybody else on public comment? For it, I have one comment. One after, but I want to. Anybody else on public comment? I don't see any. Chief Slayman, could I have you come up, please? I know it's public comment, and we don't have it. But I'd like you to give us a uh, rundown of what happened yesterday, and and uh, tell us how. Um, tell us what happened because yesterday was, you know. Well, just talk to us a little bit about. Sure. It. So yesterday was one of those days that um, reminded me how fortunate I am to be a firefighter and to lead a great organization. Uh, 1046 yesterday morning, we were dispatched to an apartment fire um, on Pheasant Avenue on the east side of town, just east of our public works. And uh, en route, we were informed uh, that there was at least one child trapped in the upstairs apartment uh, that was on fire. Uh, we arrived uh, within five minutes. The first engine happened to be, um, engine 53 happened to be training over at station 52 and was already in their gear. And uh, so they had a very quick turnout time and response. Um, they, uh, they were confronted with heavy fire conditions from the second floor of a two-story apartment complex um, with a, uh, with a uh, gentleman trying to rescue his brother uh, from the exterior um, using a, uh, a utility ladder. Crews made a quick um, uh, entry into the building, uh, basically a tremendous team effort. Uh, several several uh, members, several firefighters took a hose line up to the second floor and began fire attack to, uh, to start extinguishment and to protect the, uh, the area where it was believed the child was trapped. At the same time, firefighters um, began their searches upstairs and another firefighter went up that ladder, took out the window and made an entry um, into the second floor. They were able to grab, locate the child and a dog and uh, remove the eight-year-old child within seconds um, down the ladder and he was placed immediately into one of our ambulances where we had two firefighter medics that were actually inside fighting the fire that were pulled out to begin life-saving efforts on, on the child. Um, at this time, I'm happy to report the child is doing better. Um, there's still a long ways to go. He's got a, a tough battle ahead. He did, uh, he did receive some uh, um, s uh, smoke inhalation and some other burns related to the fire. Um, and it was a matter of seconds. Um, and in addition to that, the, uh, the older brother who was watching him at the time, uh, he, uh, he had suffered several cuts in smoke inhalation himself, trying to get his brother out in a very brave effort. And uh, so he was transported to the hospital. So immediately that took four of our firefighters out of the loop. Um, but uh, it was an absolute team effort. And I wanna say kudos to all of our fire department, to our public works, to our sheriff's department. Uh, their, their assistance was tremendous, as well as our neighboring fire agencies, uh, East Fork, uh, Tahoe Douglas. Um, we had Truckee Meadows and Reno also respond. Uh, the fire had a tremendous potential to spread to other buildings. Um, especially with the rescues in effect, that takes away a lot of your resources very quickly. Um, but fortunately, we were able to get a quick knockdown on the fire. So uh, overall, a very, um, very difficult, challenging fire, but um, a very as good as you could expect of a result. Well, thanks, Chief. On behalf of all of the community here, thanks for, um, you know, sometimes we don't realize uh, the importance of public safety folks until you need it. And when you're there within five minutes and you've got people there, um, you realize, you know, all the effort we put into training and developing uh, a good team and all that pays off and paid off in saving two lives here, at least one life of the, the younger kid, the child. Um, so I think I speak for all of us on the board. Thank you for all of your, your efforts and please pass on our, our thanks to your, your team. Also, um, you know, Supervisor Bagwell, I was asking her up here, I said, you know, we were talking a little bit about it before the meeting started, and, you know, these are two kids, some, there are two kids that were not in school, and so you know, my understanding is that school, they had a late start school day, that's why they weren't in school. 
Uh, we're not, uh, I have verified all of it, but I believe they were either homeschooled or late start school. And then the, there was a 17 year old brother, the one who suffered the injuries trying to make the rescue was home watching. Mom was uh, at work. Okay, all right. Good work, thanks Chief. All right, all right. All right, any other public comment? I don't see any, okay. Uh, let's take up um, the minutes of, go to item number six. Um, Minutes of April 19th, everybody had a chance to look at those? I move to approve the minutes of April 19th, 2018 as presented. Second. There's a, there's a motion and a second. Let me get locked in here, man. Holy smokes, I'm going nuts here. Uh, <coughs> get the electronics going here. <clears throat> so everybody, good. mine's an eye. I'll, my electronics is just coming up here, so, okay. All right, let's take up uh, the agenda. We need a vote. We need a vote. I thought we all voted. No. no. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. One abstention. One abstention. Uh, four, aye, one abstention. Supervisor uh, uh, Bunkowski abstained. All right, uh, let's take up uh, the agenda. I'm told that we want to pull um, the Parks and Rec appointments this afternoon, um, and then on there's an issue on item number 14 that relates to a gate on Brunswick Canyon. We'll pull that one at the request of the landowner. Um, any other changes, Mr. C City Manager, Madam City Manager? City Manager in training. City Manager in training. <laughs> okay. No other changes. No other changes. Board members, are we okay with the agenda? All right. So unless there's an objection, we will take we will take the agenda. We'll adopt the agenda as published, um, and let's move from here down to the floor, and we'll do some great things for our community. Let's do some special presentations, and so let's all move down there. Stand in the right place here, boy, I'll tell you. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to do the length of service awards to our employees today, and we have two to, to issue today. Um, first, I'd like to call up uh, Cameron Peer, who's a sewer technician, too. Where's Cameron? Come on up. Good morning. How you doing today? Good, sir. Well, Cameron, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, you know, when we see folks out with the uh, cleaning the sewer, you know, on the streets, what are they doing then? What are they doing? Here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody sees you out there, so tell us. Are you just out there running a, running a snake through there, or what are you doing? We have a couple different things. We have the uh, sewer rotters, which is basically just a giant auger to clean the lines and keep the lines flowing. And then we have, you've probably seen the big red truck driving around town with the snorkel coming off the front. That is our hydro flushing machine and it uses uh, really, really high PSI water to clean the lines and then pull the debris back so we can take it to the uh, treatment facility. And then we have a TV van that we use to inspect visually and uh, give reports to our GIS and engineers for upgrades and so on and so forth. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, Cameron. On behalf of a grateful community, please accept our appreciation for five years of service. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Come on up here. Cameron, come on up here. Anna. Where's Anna? Herring. All right. You know, you see a lot of lawyers in here, um, got the DA over there, but the real face of the district attorney's office is right here, Anna. So when you walk into the DA's office, you know, she's the one that get, greets you with a smile, even though you may not want to really want to be there. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, Anna, on behalf of a grateful community, please accept our appreciation for 10 years of 
uh, service to our great community here. Uh, and thanks for being the good face of the district attorney's Thank office. You, you always, uh, uh, you know, you, you really do have a good smile. You take care of everybody when they walk in. And as I said, sometimes it's under difficult circumstances. So thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. Come on. All right. We got a picture here, right? Yeah. So if we have any families, coworkers, friends who want to come in and support. Anybody? Come on, coworkers, we can all come up here. Come on. <laughs> come on, you got your uniforms on. Come on. All right, they don't want to come up here. Here they come. You just need huh? to you just need to prod them a little bit. <laughs> okay, everybody in the public works, come on up here. Come on. Come on, come on. <laughs> Peter Breen, you bet listening back there, I better do a good job because otherwise you're gonna hold me in contempt, I know, but all right. All right. Uh, next we have uh, could I have all the parks and rec folks that are with the kids to parks day? Come on up. Jen, bring who else we've got up here. I think, come on in here, I think is pretty best. So we can see on the T V here. This is a proclamation for Kids to Parks Day. It reads as follows. Whereas May 19th, 2018 is the eighth, eighth Kids to Parks Day organized and launched by the National Park Trust held annually on the third Saturday of May. And whereas Kids to Parks Day empowers kids and encourages families to get outdoors and visit America's parks. And we have a lot here in Carson City, over 30. And whereas it is important to introduce a new generation to our nation's parks and our Carson City Parks, and whereas we should encourage children to lead a more effective, a more active lifestyle to combat the issues of childhood obesity, diabetes, man, I can't pronounce that one, mellitus. All right, someone's gonna have to help me with that one. Hypertension and hyper, I wrote that, but hyper, <laughs> hyper close. All right, Jennifer, how do you say that word? Oh, no. uh, hyper, right here. Hyper cholesterol. <laughs> Hyper hypercholesteremia. All right, I'll read that again. We should, didn't write it. Encourage children to lead a more active lifestyle to combat the issues of childhood ob obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and other things that are affected by a, set, a sedentary lifestyle. Whereas Kids to Parks Day is open to all children and adults across the country to encourage a large, a large and diverse group of participants. And whereas Kids to Parks Day will broaden children's appreciation for nature and outdoors. Now therefore I, Robert Kroll, Mayor of Carson City, do hereby proclaim May 19, 2018 as Kids to Parks Day and encourage all of our residents to participate in Kids to Parks Day and to take their children 
and to take the children in their lives to a neighborhood, state, or national park and enjoy the great outdoors that this wonderful country and community we live in has to offer. So um, this is a proclamation. I'd like you to have you a little talk a little bit about parks in Carson City, if you'd do that, or have anybody do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm Jennifer Budge, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, Danielle Hatch couldn't be here today, but she's really the um, brainchild behind this whole event this Saturday here in Carson City. Um, I invite you to come down to Silver Saddle Ranch. We have a lot of events. We have the kickoff for our Junior Ranger program that she's been creating. She's one of our AmeriCorps VISTA volunteers. So it's sort of like the Peace Corps domestically, and it's uh, an annual year of service that you provide to a community. And we've been really lucky to have Danielle here um, contributing to programming, outdoor education, um, and interpretive opportunities here in Carson. So. Nine o'clock. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> How many here have been out to Silver Saddle Ranch? Everybody, huh? Okay, all right. Quite, a, quite an addiction across the city. All right. All right, let's Thank get a so picture. Much. Come on. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, do I have, uh, who's here with Nevada Energy? And All right, who's going to present all this? Okay, come on up. I don't, let's see, do I have this? Tom, go ahead, here. All right, thank you. All right. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Better? Yeah. Is, does that work? Does that work? Uh, we can come up front and you can put that. Yeah, that'll work. Good? Okay. Kind of an odd situation. It works fine. Good. That's it. That's the important thing. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor and Supervisors and everyone in the audience. Uh, my name is Jesse Murray. I'm a Vice President here in Northern Nevada for NV Energy. Um, I get the uh, honor of representing a team here today that installed uh, 17 different energy efficiency projects uh, on various city facilities here in Carson City. Uh, the team included, of course, the Carson City Department of Public Works, NV Energy, DNVGL, and Amoresco. Uh, we are here on behalf of the customers of MV Energy to present a check today here uh, in the amount of $134,000. Uh, All right. All right. The 17 projects will result in a savings of 1.91 million kilowatt hours annually. That's the equivalent of 210 homes, energy delivered to 210 homes here in Carson City. Um, we'd like to thank all the city leaders uh, for the efforts to continually look for ways to reduce uh, electricity usage, uh, saving costs, and ultimately improving the quality of lives uh, for the residents here in Carson City. Uh, NV Energy and DNVGL, who is our administrative partner for this energy efficiency program, um, are proud to offer programs like this uh, in which we provide incentives to our customers to help install energy efficiency projects and ultimately reduce their electricity usage. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Frost, who's the Senior Business Development Engineer for Amoresco. Uh, he's going to introduce uh, the team members and talk a little bit more about the project. Thank you, Jesse. This is the culmination of over two years of working together between the city and NV Energy and our team here. And I'd just like to thank everybody that was uh, a part of that in making that a success. We're happy to report that the over $4 million project is now all complete. And the savings from the utility expenditures that we're guaranteeing will pay for the debt service on the special financing that we approved a little over two years ago. So, a little reminder on that. I'd like to just recognize our project manager, Willie Mutafitis, who is a Carson City native. And our uh, development engineer, Chelsea Wolfman. 
And then I would also like to have Tom Grundy. This doesn't happen without a public works team that is all in and wants to help. And I'm proud to be from Northern Nevada because the type of people that Tom represents and that you represent is who I want to belong with. Thank you. I think it's also important to recognize um, all the Carson City staff who are involved with this project. The facilities staff, Ron Reed and Jim Foster, who couldn't be here today. but um, And also every single Carson City employee who had to put up with the disruption of a construction project where they work and put up with temperature set points that might not be exactly what they would prefer. I hear a little bit about that. I, yeah, <laughs> we all hear a little bit about that. It's getting better. We're getting used to it. So, thank you. Yeah, let's come out in here. This is a proclamation of, uh, regarding National Drug Court Month, May 20, 2018. It reads as follows, whereas there are now more than 3,000 treatment courts uh, nationwide, and whereas treatment courts are the cornerstone of the justice reform sweeping the nation, and whereas treatment courts have served more than 1.4 million individuals, and whereas they are recognized as the most successful judicial system intervention in our nation's history, and whereas they gave up, they save up to $27 for every dollar invested and up to $13,000 for every individual they serve. That's savings. And whereas treatment occurs, treatment courts uh, substantially reduce addiction and related crime and do so at a less expense than any other criminal justice strategy. And whereas treatment courts improve education, employment, housing, and financial stability, promote family reunification, reduce foster care placements, and increase the rate of addicted mothers delivering babies who are fu fully drug-free. And whereas treatment courts facilitate community-wide partnerships, bringing together public safety and public health professionals. And whereas treatment courts demonstrate that when one person rises out of substance use and crime, we all rise. Now, therefore, I, Robert Kroll, Mayor of Carson City, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, do hereby proudly proclaim May, the month of May 2018, as Drug Court Month. And uh, I want to give this proclamation to our, to our uh, court system. I want them to say a few words, but let me, uh, at the beginning here, just say, there's a gentleman here who's standing over here. He looks like he's a little older man. His name is uh, uh, Judge Peter Breen, and I think it's fair to say, I think and you guys correct me, but, you know, Judge Breen was instrumental in... in kicking off uh, drug court in Nevada. 
He's been instrumental in seeing it, it through. He's been a true pioneer in, in um, not just the legal profession, but in ways to make people's lives better and to uh, reduce uh, some of the impacts that people go through in the, in the judicial system. Um, and I'm proud to say that uh, Judge Breen is a, a longtime personal friend of mine uh, and is also his parents. I think his dad was a judge down there in, in uh, what is it, Esmeralda, was it there? Tonopah, then Tonopah. Tonopah, Goldfield, and Hawthorne. His sister still lives part-time in, in, in Belmont. And his dad and my dad were in the, my dad wasn't a judge down there, he was practicing law. But it's a real pleasure for me to have, um, and a pleasure for our community to have uh, Judge Peter Breen here today to accept this proclamation for National Drug Court Month because you've done so much for us, Peter, and so thanks. And so, Tom, could I have you, or who's going to do it? The, yeah. the icon, the icon is going to do it. The icon, Judge Tatro, or the icon? Okay, we got two icons here. Yeah. All right, here you go. Can we? Do you want to say anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah we have a few things here. All right, here you go. Come on. Icon two, you like icon one or two? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm department two, soon to be leaving. But um, no, I'm honored to have Judge Breen up here with us. And, and uh, I think drug courts are definitely the way to go. Judge Breen saw that back in, in fact, when I went to the National Judicial College to learn how to do mental health court, which is a drug court with a mental health component, we had instructors from all over the country experts from all over the country on mental illness and how to conduct a mental health court. And during the middle of our training, they said, but now we're going to go see it live with the expert, the one who knows it best. And we all, the class, like 60 of us, went over to judges from all over the country, went over to watch Judge Breen conduct mental health court and learn, and drug court, and learn how it's done. He's the, he started it. So our special master, want to say anything? Well, thank you, and specialty courts are really important, and it's nice that we have one here that started back in 1999 for our juveniles. The whole purpose of juvenile court is to hopefully keep kids from coming into the adult system, and we, we can provide them services such as the structure of a juvenile drug court, which, as you guys all know, takes a, a huge community effort to do. And so we provide those kids the structure, the services that they need to one, get rid of their substance abuse, and two, help stop that cycle of them entering into the adult system. So we appreciate this. Thank you. Do we have a we have a short PowerPoint? Are we gonna? You do have a PowerPoint. We have a short PowerPoint. I'll just save my comments for my part of the PowerPoint, and yeah. then we'll Why don't we get, get through it. it. That's okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Where's the PowerPoint? Who's doing it? Do we have it? Yes, he's doing it. All right. Yeah. yeah, I think right here is fine. So we put together a brief, I think it's like nine or ten slide PowerPoint presentation kind of detailing the, the history of drug courts and what we have going on here in Carson City. And so if you bear with us, we'll, uh, we'll go through this. Um, so today's National Drug Court Month, um, or this month is May, of, um, I guess it's a, a national month for other things. But today we're talking about drug courts. And so we have a number in Carson City. We have the Western Regional Drug Court and DUI Court, and that's the one that Judge Breen, um, Senior Judge Breen, um, supervises um, with a couple of other judges, and it's regional, and they and they go around the rural regions, and um, and and hold drug courts in the different communities that need it. It's a consolidated court to service um, the rural regions. We have uh, in in the Justice Municipal Court, um, Judge Chaitra and I each have a a court. Judge Chaitra runs the Mental Health Court. I run the Misdemeanor Treatment Court, and then I believe in the Juvenile Court. You have the Juvenile Drug Court. And the family dependency court is okay, juvenile drug court. So we'll go to the next slide here. So the, the drug courts have their roots in the 80s um, in, in, the, in the crack epidemic, and the increase of crime, and the law enforcement response to that. Um, criminal justice system was, uh, the prisons were overflowing, and they were realizing that the, the drug epidemic was not, and typical interventions were not, were not changing things. And so the new laws didn't, didn't rec decrease use, it just increased punitive response. Um, dockets were overwhelmed and, and judges and people in the system were seeing that it was just a treadmill. Just a, I think the term I, I remember hearing was a parade of misery. Every, every week 
every month of, of people who are drug addicts who just couldn't get out of the system and couldn't make changes. So drug courts were developed, I believe, as a court of Florida in the mid-90s, started the very first drug court. It's expedited case management, and it was really just case processing issues only, but uh, they realized that, you know, you mandate treatment instead of just jail time or prison time, and oftentimes without, without further um, interventions, it just didn't stick, um, and, and the treatment wasn't working. So um, it developed from, from those roots. So drug courts are a high specialized court process that functions within the existing court structure to address nonviolent drug and alcohol addicted um, or mentally ill offenders. It's a different response. It's, 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 uh, it's, and it's evidence-based at this point. I mean, it's been going on for, it's been going on for years, and it's evidence-based. Um, is, is that my end? Am I in? Is Max that the end of mine? All right, I got to pass the baton now to who's next? Jim. Okay. All right. So I kind of mentioned this earlier. So drug courts are really made up from a community effort, and they were a team, and that's how we refer to it as. Um, so it's not just the judge. It's um, from the district attorney's office, the public defender's office, the Department of Alternative Sentencing, and also the component, especially with mental health, even though, like, the juvenile court is a drug court, we still have a mental health component where we have... Um, mental health professionals from the community come in who are seeing the kids and the families come in and they're part of the team to provide the services as a whole. Parole and probation, of course, treatment staff, the coordinators, it's important that um, these programs that are highly specialized have a coordinator. Make sure everything's running, all the data is being inputted, um, everybody's get, getting the services that they need. Of course, court staff, um, sheriff's deputies, health and housing liaisons, um, Department of Child and Family Services. Um, and then the other one that I was gonna mention is also the schools. Uh, one of the resources that we need to get back into um, specifically for, for us, the juvenile core is the, the school component and, and we're working on that currently. So it's a huge community effort with regards to these teams. And then this is the cycle of addiction. This is what these courts are put into place to try to prevent. So it starts with substance abuse, which mainly leads right to crime. And then they're in the court systems. You've got the incarceration. And then no treatment. No treatment kind of sends you right back into the cycle. They don't have the supports. They don't have, um, sometimes they just don't know. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. This is just their life. Especially if it begins as a child, that's what they know. Um, so trying to break this cycle is really what these courts are set up to do. Thank you. Max choreographed this, so this one's mine. Um, the drug courts in Carson City, the district court, um, adult drug court, which Judge Breen heads, has been going on for 14 years and with 108 participants currently, I believe. And then uh, the, he also runs the DUI felony court. It's been going on for 10 years. These are great services that are being provided to this community that I think kind of go unnoticed sometimes. I have mental health court. It's been going on since 2005. We average 30 participants, 25 to 35 is a number. Um, and it, it's a fantastic program. Misdemeanor treatment court that uh, Judge Armstrong heads, I think is, really the way to go because his philosophy, and I support it 100%, is get them in the beginning, get them before they're felons, get their lifestyle changed, get, their, get them off that cycle in time. And then juvenile drug court for 19 years. I didn't realize they'd been in that long, but, but they had. It's a very progressive. Next slide. So the, the the big thing about a drug court or a specialty court is it's non-adversarial. And I think we'll sit there as judges and we'll watch the public defender argue for the guy to go to jail in our staffing maybe and the, and the district attorney is saying, well, I'm not so sure, which is totally opposite of what we ever see in court. It's like we're, everybody's in this for the good of the client, for the good of the person, the participant, to try to get them on the road. It isn't a traditional courtroom dynamic. It, it's it's non-adversarial. A key is the intensive probation supervision. These guys go, they come to court every week. So during that week's period, they get visited by probation officers. They have to be tested. They go to counseling. And then we get reports every week in staffing and discuss it as a team. It's kind of a holistic approach. And it cuts off 
normally when we see them before we had specialty courts, they were a train wreck. They would, it'd be, they're so far gone by the time they get back to court that we're starting from ground zero once again. Um, the drug testing, evidence-based treatment practices are what we do. Um, it is a collaboration among agencies throughout Carson City, which is a great thing. And as I said, it's a holistic approach. Um, is there another slide? I thought there was. Our goals are to get people into treatment. That's the number one thing. Without treatment, they're going to use again. Reduce drug and alcohol related offenses. Almost every offense we have in Carson City is drug and, al or, and or alcohol related. Uh, it's just a fact. Re reduce recidivism and bring people back to a life with where they're raising their kids and they're working, they're employed. It's bring some normalcy into their lives. Um, increase the number of participants who are gainfully employed. When I had mental health court you know, six years ago, we couldn't get people jobs because jobs were not very available. Now everybody's working and same with drug court. And we encourage people to get their GEDs and to get their education. Um, have I covered everything? And then of course to um, decrease the number of participants who deliver drug endangered and or fetal alcohol syndrome babies. And that's a very rewarding thing to see someone who's been addicted to meth or heroin all that time and, and, and give birth to a healthy, normal baby. That's, um, you know, that's what we work for. Um, and then the money, just, just so you guys know. None of this money comes from the city. District court, adult drug court, uh, gets 80000 from the specialty court funding fee. Uh, the felony court, $27,943. That's how we fund it. Mental health court shows a big $158,000 figure. $100,000 of that is, doesn't come to the court. It goes to um, Carson Rural Clinics for them to have staff to supervise and, and treat the people in mental health court. And then misdemeanor treatment court is 23,000. It should be 50,000. He needs more money, so you guys next meeting. And then, uh, I, it isn't, but that's what we're here for. No, I'm kidding. We're just here for awareness. The icon here would be putting the arm on We're putting the arm on you. Uh, and then juvenile drug court is 10,000. And, and again, the, and it should be 50. All this comes from specialty court funding fees that are created by traffic tickets. There's an administrative assessment on every traffic ticket. $7 of it goes to specialty court funding. You funded a lot of it. They, they never catch him in that Dodge Charger that he drives or whatever it is. At any rate, that's where we're at. And then Judge Breen was going to say a few words. Our, our icon, number one. Icon one. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, so my name is Peter Breen. I've been in the felony courts as a sitting district judge or a senior judge for 44 years. So I've been asked to do a little history of the, quick history of the drug court movement, uh, which means uh, I've been around so long I can say just about anything. And... Uh, uh, Nobody will know what actually happened. I would like to say, yes, I was raised, uh, I was raised in Goldfield in Tonopah. Yes, Goldfield had a grammar school. It still has a grammar school and educated uh, in Tonopah High School. Same place that the mayor started from. Uh, uh, if he'd only stayed long enough. Uh, uh, we, yes, we were the, the Tonopah High School muckers. I might, I, We'll inform you all that we were the last team to beat Virginia City Muckers before they went on their 20 or 30 year run as the <laughs> state basketball championships. But I would like to state this. The drug court movement began out of a colossal failure. All the law enforcement um, authorities in Dade County, Florida, Miami, that great city in southeastern United States, they decided that there was too much cocaine on the streets. So they got together and, and they performed a one-year experiment where they'd arrest everybody, put them in jail, pushers, users, anybody connected with cocaine. And at the end of that year, they met. And they all, this is the result. The courts were crippled. The jails were overcrowded. And the price of cocaine was 10% cheaper than it was when they started. So they thought a little bit more. A couple of intermediate appellate court judges and they 
borrowed a concept from two psychologists who were trying to get the judiciary to form a mental health court. But drugs were the big thing in 1989 and 1990, and they started a drug court from that. And the rest is sort of history. Uh, Judge Lehman formed the first drug court here in uh, Clark County. He took uh, Choices Unlimited as their care provider, who were a Reno-based uh, psychological and behavioral uh, a company that helped people with addiction. I got started in 1995 with four people, July the 3rd. Three of those people were under the influence of methamphetamine. That was what was big in the eastern slopes of the Sierra at that time. Then, uh, as time went on, Judge Blake from uh, Fallon in Yarrington uh, called me, and he was known as a very conservative judge. And he says, hey, bring, uh, I'm going I'm to do what you're doing in Reno. Uh, tell me what I need. And I says, well, Judge Blake, you need $30,000 to hire a psychiatrist to rewire your brain. Because... <laughs> You're going to have to think differently. And sure enough, he did. Uh, he actually went and got a PhD in uh, drug court evaluation, a doctorate. He's the most well-read uh, member of the judiciary, I believe. He keeps up to date on everything that's going on in, uh, in addiction recovery related to the courts. Then we got together in 2005, and with the consent of the Supreme Court, the sitting district court judges in in uh, Mineral County, Churchill County, Lyon County, Douglas County, Carson City, and Virginia City, we f we combine the rural and the urban courts, and we sit as a kind of a bunch of circuit court judges, uh, and we've been doing that ever since uh, 2006, and. Uh, <clears throat> It's kind of hard for me to consider Carson City a rural area. I mean, it really is. This is, a, this is a big city now. But it's part of, the, part of our system. And I gave a speech just, just to give you an idea of what has happened. I gave a speech to the Narcotics Anonymous Association in, in Reno two weeks ago. And we don't have a, a accurate statistics before 2004 because everybody changed their computers then. But since uh, the end of 2003, we've had well over 20,000 people that have entered one of our felony specialty courts, and that includes Judge Tatro's, because you have a lot, of, a lot of felons that we have in there. And uh, now that, that doesn't mean everybody graduated, but that's a lot of people in Northwestern Nevada that aren't going to prison and are, have graduated from one of these courts with a way to deal with addiction. And that is the basic history of uh, the specialty courts, the drug courts, and other courts, veterans court, prison reentry court, mental health court. Um, there's youth offender courts. Uh, there are uh, courts, uh, medically assisted treatment courts, a new experiment experiment in dealing with uh, heroin and opiates. Uh, I believe we have, uh, uh, we are right on the cutting edge of what's happening in the specialty courts in America. Thank you. Well said. All right. that, that's why he's an icon. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Got anything else, judges? All right, let's have everybody from the judicial system that wants to come up here. Mr. DA, come on. Come on up here. Let's get a picture of everybody. Don't leave. Come on. Kimberly, come on, get up here. Come on.
All right, why don't we just take a break? Yeah, they already did. Oh, they, oh. oh, how about that? All right, here I'm out here by myself. All right, let's take a, we'll, we'll be in recess for about five minutes. All right, take a break. Did we get your idea? small uh, <laughs> recess there. We're now going to take up the consent agenda. We're ready to go again. It's okay if you need more time. All right, we're on item number uh, the consent agenda. Any member of the public want anything pulled from the consent agenda for individual discussion? Any board member? I don't see any motions in order to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda consisting of one item from the city manager, two items from finance, and two items from purchasing and contracts. There's a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Carried. Okay. Let's now move on to uh, item number 13. This is for the from the treasurer. This is uh, to accept the affidavit and report from of the April 27, 2018 delinquent property tax sale pursuant to Nevada revised statutes. Uh, Gail, Ms. Robertson, do you want to take us through this? To just give us a report on what happened there. So last September 21st, uh, you as the Board of Supervisors ordered that I sell the delinquent uh, properties. At that time, I believe there were just um, eight properties on that list. And so we went through a long process. We had to notify, all, do a title search, notify all the people, post it in public places, put it in the newspaper. So the affidavit shows that we actually did um, what you ordered us to do. And then um, in the end, what happened was six of the properties had paid the taxes prior to the sale, prior to the due date, which was three business days before the sale. We pulled one property because we found out or determined that it was protected by bankruptcy laws. And then we actually auctioned off one property. It was a um, mobile home out on Mayflower Way. So the results were that it sold for $76,000. Um, what we do with that money is um, 
We paid almost $3,800 in back taxes and penalties and costs. $1,300 goes into our general fund. And the remaining $70,901.02 is going to be held in a special fund account um, for up to one year, waiting for people who might have, um, um, right, yeah. So we expect to hear from Carson City. <laughs> there are two liens on the property um, from the Municipal Code Department, and there is a, um, a Medicaid lien on the property, so we'll probably hear from them, claiming some of the excess proceeds, and then there are some relatives. But if no one comes forward, then the money will go into the general fund. Gail, I just want to commend you. It's a lot of work to go through this process every year, but the goal is not to sell private property, or excuse me, real property, is to get people to pay their taxes. And because there's a right of redemption on the properties that we do sell, there's no guarantee that it's going to stay sold for a year after we go through that process anyway. No, there is no right of redemption, actually. Really? Yeah. They would have to go through the courts and say that our whole process was wrong. It's not mm -hmm. the same as if they come forward and, and pay the taxes at this point. It's been sold. Right. So then we hold the money for a year for what period then? What's just to take care of any third party Why? Claims. Did, just to give the people time to come forward and file their claim. Mm -hmm. And then we would have to we'll work with the DA's office for them to determine the order of priority of the claims. Yeah. Okay. I've heard from other treasurers that sure enough, you know, they didn't realize there was a Medicaid lien on the property and then sure enough, Health and Human Services shows up at the 12th hour. So. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, From the, I'm retired, but I have a little continuing legal education. When does the right of redemption start in normally? When, but not, there isn't a right of redemption so, in this so process. So we're out of, not on this pro process, but when, when, does a right of rede when does a taxpayer get a right of redemption to reacquire their property? I don't think a taxpayer actually does. The, most, the only time I've seen it recently was um, in Douglas County, a court ordered the sale of property to pay um, monies that they owed other people. And so there was a right of redemption on that. So the person who bought that property through the auction actually just had to kind of sit there and think, maybe I don't actually own this property just yet because the person who they took the property from could have come back and paid. All right. But in this case, it's, it's a done deal. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Public comment on this? Anybody? Don't see any motions in order. I move to accept the affidavit and report of the April 27, 2018 delinquent property tax sale per NRS 361.5958. There's a motion and a second on the motion discussion. Hearing and seeing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Carried. Thanks, Gail. All right. Now let's take up item number 14. This is uh, for discussion only. This is a uh, Presentation, discussion, and potential direction regarding uh, small cell equipment uh, installation in Carson City owned poles and city owned street lights and other city rights of way. Uh, got a little taste of this with the public comment period at the beginning. So, who's doing this? Stephanie? Ms. Hicks, you doing that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. For the record, Stephanie Hicks, Real Property Manager. I also have Dan Stuckey, our city engineer, with me this morning. There's actually been a team of city staff that have been working on this, so um, there may be others that have some more technical expertise in different areas that we can defer questions to. James Jacklett, our operations manager, is also here. We've been working with Lee Plemmel in community development, and then also Dan Yu with the district attorney's office. Our purpose for bringing this item forward um, to the supervisors today is that this is a very new emerging technology. And we've had some discussions, um, some informal proposals from some of the carriers. And we want to stop and take a minute and talk about what um, benefits and also what requirements we think are important for the city to impose. So just a little bit of background on small cell wireless technology. I don't at all um, pretend to be the, the know-all on this topic. And again, it, it's emerging and it, it's just so new that it is continuing to change. But really, um, 5G is the next phase of cellular technology. 
And what we're going to see is we're going to see a transition from the carriers, the large carriers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, from those macro towers, the large towers that we see on the hillsides and disguised as trees in different areas, to what is a small cell antenna device. And the intent of the small cell antenna device is that it, it's going to be much more um, densely located, but it will also have the ability to transmit much larger um, capacity for, for data sharing on a cellular level. So for people who have cell phones and mobile devices, they're going to be able to at some point be able to download a high resolution video in a matter of seconds. So the intent is to locate this um, radio antenna infrastructure in our urban corridor in the more densely populated areas where people are utilizing their mobile devices. And so as you can see on the exhibit, um, you know, there's a few things that are, that are part of the overall um, system infrastructure. First of all, they're going to need a place to locate. And so what is being considered at this point is um, there has been some discussion, and we'll get into that, about new poles. But what we're proposing is co-location on existing light poles and traffic signals and other um, city infrastructure so that we're not putting new infrastructure in our right-of-way. But they're also going to need to put in some um, fiber con conduit cable in some instances. Um, I know that, there, I believe that there's one carrier that actually has a, um, a microwave transit mission, um, but they do need what they call as a backhaul. So that's another component of the infrastructure. And then power. So those are the three components that they will need as they come in and make requests to um, utilize our right-of-way for that. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time about talking with what we've seen so far. In our major um, discussions so far have been with mobility. They've come in and they've really helped educate us on, on what this new 5G um, system is going to be, and we, we do appreciate that. I think that they have equally been feeling us out to see what we would allow, as well as us determining what we think are going to be better requirements for, for our city and our streetscape, because we've spent a lot of effort and costs on making our our downtown new and vibrant and proposals like the example of, of this very large pole are, are not what we want to see in our right-of-way currently. So it has been a, a really good learning process for us. We've also um, contemplated whether there, as I said previously, whether we would allow any new antenna, or pardon me, new poles. So this is an, a proposed example of a new pole on South Carson Street, which again, um, we are looking for your direction, but at this point, staff's you know determination is this is not desirable to be in our streetscape either. And so the compromise that we're looking for is to be able to attach on our own existing um, poles and infrastructure. This is another example of a, of a new pole proposed on Stewart. So what I think we've learned in the last, uh, it's really been probably over a year that we've engaged and started having these conversations, is that um, deployment without any design standards could potentially result in some things that are, are not desirous visually. And, and I have some examples of those that are up top. Those are actually examples, um, some of those were examples we received from Clark County. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what our neighboring communities are doing. But um, in these examples, they had um, deployed this infrastructure without having any design standards in place. And there certainly is a benefit to our community and to our citizens for us to help assist and move this technology forward because of the access and even economic development and businesses. But deployment with design standards, as you can see in the photos on the bottom, um, just aesthetically are much more pleasing and I think in line with what we've been trying to do with our streetscape designs. So we learned through um, this process, and actually it was Mobility who let us know that the city of Reno um, had been working on drafting some codes over the last year. And they have um, also been having workshops with the 
the four main carriers. We were able to attend one recently, um, and, and it's been a great opportunity for us to learn what's going on. They're, they're at least a year ahead of us in this, um, in drafting their code, working on license agreements with the carriers. But one of the other things that they're doing that we'd like to follow really closely is they've asked the carriers to provide some mock-up designs. So they're actually submitting permits, and they'll be installing poles in the city of Reno so that you, you can go on site and take a look at what they're proposing and what it will look like. The intent of this is to get a real clear picture of what's being proposed uh, you know, in line with what they're drafting in their code. And so we see it as a fantastic opportunity for us to be part of that as we move forward as well. We did also follow, um, Douglas County had a license agreement that was taken forward to their board. Um, and at that time, it, it was not approved. The board of commissioners decided that there were too many unknowns. There weren't, um, you know, additional code in place that they were comfortable with. And so they decided at that time not to approve it. I imagine their staff's going to continue to work on that as well. And Clark County probably has the most experience, at least in Nevada. There are certainly other examples um, nationally and some really good examples um, in Sacramento, in the city of Sacramento, where they've, where they've deployed some of this. But Clark County is probably the largest in um, Nevada. They've been working with the small cell provider since 2006. And we had an opportunity to have a conference call with their public works department, and they were able to give us some lessons learned. And one of those was they started deploying these before they had design standards in place. And so now they're going back um, and they're taking the time at this point to look at some things that um, they didn't consider before. And some of those have to do with just what the equipment is going to look like on the pole, but also proximity of placement. So because as you, as you can imagine, you know, in Clark County on the Las Vegas Strip, that's, that's a high density of population there any given day, people on cell phones and on mobile devices. And so there, it has become an issue how closely these poles are being installed in the right of way. So that's something they're kind of taking a step back on and they're, they're looking at. We have, um, We've been advised that, you know, nationally, we're going to see a change from about 350,000 macro towers that are currently in existence to probably over a million small cell devices by 2023. So that's nationally. Um, initially, we had some conversations with a consultant firm who um, has done a lot of work with the city of Sacramento, and they actually reached out to us. Um, they act kind of as the intermediary between the carriers and the community, and they advised us that they thought it was possible that for Carson City, we could see 50 small cell requests per carrier. So that would be 50 antennas, times four, you know, that's a, that's a hundred. I think in the discussions that we've had so far and what we've seen take place, you know, maybe we maybe it won't get that high. It's hard to say at this point, but before we start approving any, you know, five or 50, it's really important that we decide what's going to work best for our community. And so that's why we are here today. Um, we have started discussing internally on this group of staff and with others, you know, what we think are, are some starting points and talking points. And, you know, certainly one of the most important is it has to meet the requirements of Title 20 for zoning. So depending on where a proposed installation may take place, there are going to be requirements. It may have to go through the special use process, um, permit process, or an administrative review. It's going to have to meet setbacks and height. So nothing will change in regards to the zoning. Um, but again, aesthetics is really a key component. And at this point, city staff is really pushing for co-location on existing. You know, there might be a place where in, um, you know, more of a rural area, a new wooden pole could be appropriate. But we really think um, placement of new poles anywhere in our right of way right now is not desirable. There is an opportunity, um, and again, I think this has to be very carefully considered and weighed, for the city to take over some of the NV Energy streetlights that a, a carrier could propose to utilize. NV Energy is glad to turn them over to us, but it will be for our maintenance and care, and so that's an additional cost should we choose to do that. Um, and 
one of the other components that is important is that any of the equipment that's non-antenna that's needed for the electrical, um, that also really needs to be concealed or, or shielded in some way so that it's not really obvious and obtrusive on the, on the poles themselves. So we do have current provisions in our code. Um, our development standards indicate that there's no new above ground electrical equipment allowed. So, you know, if there is a needed power source, um, that it's going to have to be underground. They'll have to be come up with another way to install it. They are very, um, you know, the technology is very advanced and they have ways to have other types of, uh, of a battery power source and other things. Um, and I know the carriers, there's several of the carriers here that can provide you some detail on that information. We will require an encroachment permit. Um, and then we are also looking into a license agreement. It doesn't fall under our standard franchise agreement because um, this is a different installation. And then um, pretty consistently we're seeing where there, there are fees. So what we've seen as far as an average is um, typically between $1,200 to $1,800 per poll seems to be a standard. Um, I can tell you that Clark County's um, rate per poll is less than that. It's more along the lines of $700 per poll, but they charge a 5% um, fee for the revenue, so they get an additional cost on top of that. Um, there, and when Douglas County was proposing their um, license agreement, their fees were closer to, you know, 2000 2500 and they were, there's also the opportunity to add an incremental increase each year. So those are some of the decisions that, that we'll be bringing forward to you in the future as we work through this. I, I think it's important at this time that we really work, um, we work with our neighbors. City of Sparks is also watching what the City of Reno is doing. And one thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, obviously, and you all know this, that we have the authority over what it's going to look like um, and where it's going to be installed um, and what we're going to charge for now. And the reason I say that is there are 11 states at least that have already passed legislation that has have taken that ability away from the local government. So it's really important that we watch that and we see what's coming through our next legislative session to see if there's anything like that being opposed in the state of Nevada. And I think if we, if we work diligently towards getting our codes in place and we work regionally with the other local governments, and that gives us a strong stance should, should that come forward. The reasons why those states have done that are, are, are good arguments, you know, again, economic development, bringing the technology to their citizens, but I think that, you know, it's a, it's a fine balance. And so we wanted to bring this item forward for your discussion and information today, and we will continue to work through that process. And we're available with, for any questions we, that you have. We have, have some have. questions up here, you know, and, and it, we're Dillon's rural state, so we may be primed for somebody to come in and say the state ought to do it here too. But, you know, Stephanie, I think, at least from my perspective, I'd like to, you know, when we talk to these carriers, like Stephanie was here, Tyler was here this morning, you know, I'd like to have them on the record, you know, that they're going to work with local government and not just the state government. I mean, talk to them, I mean, because that's, I think, you know, they'll be the ones who push state control in this stuff. I mean, that's probably not a right thing to say, but it is. It's, uh, that's what happened. So uh, uh, so anyway, we'll go there. we've got some questions here. Supervisor Bronkowski, then Supervisor Abel. Uh Stephanie, my concerns. Um, so these are issues that I'd like you to bring up with the carriers. Um, first, can they share locations? So can a pole support more than one antenna? Because when you start talking about up to 200 potentially locations, then you start seeing the carriers are going to be looking for those prime locations. And then after that, you know, how do you determine what's a secondary and a tertiary location? So uh, co-location is going to be a big issue. Um, as we spoke about yesterday, um, the opportunity to expand the cell service area in town. If we're going to allow vendors to use the right of way, then I'd like to put that on the table and say, how can you help us expand the cell service area? 
Uh, if we're going to be charging fees, then should we, and this is not for the vendors, this is probably a conversation for us, but should we be looking maybe for a specific use to use those fees for? Uh, obviously aesthetics are going to be one of the biggest issues and how much of this antenna system can be underground uh, you mentioned battery packs versus hard wiring uh, for the power you know, I'd like to see more information on that what does the entire system look like other than just the visual antenna that's on, on top of the poles thank you okay <laughs> Um, Stephanie, uh, one thing, technology advances so rapidly. Um, I don't want to be installing tomorrow's albatross um, and then be stuck with it. So we want to be convinced that, you know, this is the best way to go. Um, and so I think that's hugely important. Also, um, there's a question of the end dot poles. That wasn't brought up. Can we use those? And I can, I can answer that question. So there have been requests made to the state, but also there is an opportunity for private um, property as well. And I guess the short answer is um, the state hasn't um, really been willing to cooperate in a way that has worked out for the carrier. So I don't know if that just means financially. And I know for the private, it would be much, much more expensive for the carrier to attach to a private business or a private property. So, you know, while again, there is a benefit to our citizens, I think we, you know, we're, we shouldn't, we, we aren't going to give it away <laughs> either because this is our infrastructure and there will be work and maintenance that we'll have to do on our part. So just because others have told them no or are going to cost more, I think we amply will, should, should do what we need to for the city. And then the last que question I have is you mentioned something about um, having, about having to uh, dig up for some of the infrastructure to go in, are we going to be digging up what we've already done in, let's say, our downtown corridor, or our Curry Street improvements to be installing this? Yeah, yeah, Dan, well, you can add in. Dan Stuckey, city engineer for the record. So yeah, we, we need to look at that stuff. I mean, we're not going to, um, something that just was recently paved to digging up the streets. So yeah, that's going to be part of the evaluation process moving forward. And just to add to that for a minute, there was a conversation about this in a, in a way at the City of Reno's meeting, and the discussion was there may be the need to obtain easements from the private property owners that are on the edge of the right-of-way so that they don't have to dig up our new sidewalks or our um, infrastructure, and also to meet ADA requirements because that's something that's really important. You know, our sidewalks are there for our pedestrians' use, and we don't want equipment or things there that are gonna that are gonna obstruct that. So there may be the need still if they find a location that's gonna work to obtain an easement from a private property owner to install some of their equipment. Um, we also. Um, you know, want want to carefully consider that in all ways. One last question I have too is, and I'll use the downtown poles as an example. I know even putting the flower baskets on them, it's all about engineering and what they can withstand. Adding more equipment to that, can the poles withstand something like that? Yeah, that's um, a great question, and actually something that Clark County, when we discussed with them, they talked about. You know, when you put yeah, you start adding more and more equipment to these poles. You know, you start getting into, is it structurally able to support that equipment? And really there needs to be the engineering analysis component of that to making sure that, that we can make that work. So that, yeah, the, that's a good point and that will be a consideration when we evaluate these. And a follow up on Karen's question, um, Dan. When, when we did the downtown streetscape project, uh, I thought I, re I remember that we put in some additional conduit just to accommodate situations like this for future installations of underground is that true i believe we did uh i don't know if james you have details on that but my understanding i'm, I'm not sure exactly what was done on carson street but i believe you are correct on that and are we also going to do that on the curry street portion yes yes we yes Good morning, James Jacklett, Operations Manager, Public Works. So downtown Carson Street specifically, we have conduit that was installed for our fiber optic usage. There's been an ongoing discussion and uh, 
consideration for years about whether we should invest in putting in infrastructure that we would at some point be willing to lease out or share. So that is a possibility as always. Cost sharing of this infrastructure is, is what this is all about, whether it's going to be the light the, the light poles, the traffic signals, or the conduit in the ground, anything's possible. And it's, we just need to come up with a, a system that's going to weigh those benefits against uh, what our investment, make sure we get the best value of it, out of it for our, for our citizens. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Karen's correct, uh, everything's changing very fast, but 5G is going to be around for a while. And 5G is, uh, along with AI, two of the big things. So I'm concerned because uh, um, I hope the state doesn't take this away from us. The uh, mayor's correct, we're dealing with a little state, and so that may come. But uh, I urge you to look at this as uh, an investment that the carriers have to make and they have to make it with in cooperation with us and we should we don't want to penalize them or anything like that but we should charge what the traffic will bear and so and i'm very much in favor of your design standards idea and uh, we have something on our agenda later that i probably will say something stupid about So uh, I guess for me, I, I'm more interested in how you think you're going to structure the opportunity to put the electronics on the poles. If you have four carriers, how is it that we determine who gets the pole, who gets the primary spot, who gets the secondary? And so just a thought when we're developing that is to piggyback a little bit off of what Supervisor Bankowski said, is to look at potentially the plan that they will give us to participate in the expansion and so that I don't know if we're going to set up like a little bid or an RFP to say here's the what pretend these are the 50 polls that Carson City is willing to put out to bid right now for cell service and let them give us their offers to see who wants to be the best partner with Carson City because it is about getting better infrastructure through the rest of the city. We still have lots of areas with really poor cell service. So <coughs> just a thought when we're trying to develop this, because if you're just going to say it's 1,200 to 1,800, there's still no definition of who gets the poll. So just a thought that we structure for some of our needs. Thank you. And some considerations that we've made um, in this regard and with talking with that consultant firm that does this for other communities and um, as an opportunity to always do something towards our asset management, we have um, one of our tasks for this year that we want to do is go out and inventory all of these polls to determine what which of these would be the appropriate place to locate them, create that asset management GIS database for that so that when the carriers come in, we already know what is you know available in our mind. Um, there has been discussions, and as part of that meeting with the city of Reno, there was a conversation about exactly that. What if somebody comes in and reserves 10 poles? What if they never build on them, and now they've just blocked us from doing that? So some of the things that we've thought about, although I do, I do like your idea as well, is that um, we could reserve poles, but for a very limited amount of time. So that, like, for example, if they're not ready to construct within six months, then they lose their reservation and it now becomes open to someone else. Uh, certainly, the carriers are in different... Um, you know, in different timelines and time frames and whether or not they're ready to actually put something in the ground here, you know, they, they have those schedules of their own. So it, it may work out that way that we allow them to reserve so many, but, uh, you know, upon a six-month period, if they've not installed now, that's going to go back in the mix. But certainly those are things that we, we still need to consider. Uh, James, um, going back to the conduit um, is there a security issue if we lease capacity in the conduit that the city plan on putting fiber in would we have to give up then our ability to put fiber in that conduit if we did that yeah so it's a good question and there are always security concerns not just our internal security concerns but the concerns of that uh, of that carrier. So oftentimes what has been done in these situations is uh, 
they we may turn over or lease a part of that infrastructure and require them to put in additional boxes off to the side so that they can have their separate it would be the same trench the same the conduit would be side by side but they would be able to have a separate or an isolated uh, piece of infrastructure i think that uh, it's very reasonable that we uh, keep our eye on these and as these proposals come forward we'll evaluate each one to make sure our interest and the interest of the carrier is protected and, and come up with the best agreement uh, that works for everybody and uh, with that realize the the one thing that, that was mentioned but is worth highlighting is that it's important for the carrier to get these small cell locations on top of those dense urban areas. So if they want to get a crowd, that's where they need the capacity. So in a lot of these cases, they, they talk about intersections, they talk about the, that downtown district. Uh, that's, that's why they're, one of the reasons they're coming to us is to get closer to the people. Uh, and with that, I, we're going to be able to help them some. We have some infrastructure to offer, but I, I would count on a, a substantial amount of uh, infrastructure that's going to need to go into place for each of these carriers, especially if there's 50 apiece and 200 going into Carson City. There's, we have a little bit to give. They're still going to have a lot to install. I know we have AT&T out in the audience. Are there other carriers out there? Could, who are you, who are you with, sir? Um, I'm with Mobility, representing Sprint, this particular project. Um, I'm going to ask Stephanie to come up and talk with it. If you have some questions, you jump in here. But Stephanie, could you come up for, talk to us. I know you spoke a little bit during the public <coughs> comment, but, you know, talk to us a little bit about what Supervisor uh, Abel was saying. You know, <clears throat> this seems like, <clears throat> you know, in, in a world where we're trying to go, electronic, it seems like a whole lot of infrastructure inconvenience, call it that. Uh, and, you know, how long is something like that going to last? I mean, the world's changing. How, so just talk to me a little bit. Talk to us about it. Okay, let me, again, for the record, Stephanie Tyler representing AT&T. Um, just to kind of put this in a larger perspective, um, and maybe, you know, we can talk about this more a lot, you know, as we as we go forward. And again, I have to, I have to commend your team in terms of, again, how they're looking at this regionally, right? They're getting some great learning experiences from where the city of Reno is going, Sparks. And again, this is about our whole region. So the, the way this system will ultimately work is you will still have some of the macro towers, right, the larger towers. These small cells are intended to be infill. And, and, you know, while I think it was important to see some of the don't do's, if you will, which were some of those pictures, this, um, these, 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 the development around um, these small cells literally changes on a monthly basis. And um, all of the providers are learning and, and developing as we go based on what local communities are telling us that they need. Um, so, again... The, the 5G network will ultimately be primarily run over these small cells. And again, just to put it in perspective for purposes of economic development, 5G is going to be faster than the current one gig, two gig that everybody is so excited about that you can actually have in fiber in the ground. So this is going to be literally instantaneous. And the latency, which is a term we use and drives me crazy, but it's just the speed of how it can bounce and work, needs to be closest to the people for to be able to use some of these new things that, 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 that are going to be coming that um, Supervisor Aboud made reference to. But this is the framework, the small cells, of what that is going to be. Right? So let's just fast forward in our minds for a second that we put in, you know, a series of small cells and again, I'm not going to speak for other carriers, but we believe the, the beauty of, quite frankly, uh, how Carson City is designed is the, in, the, in, in the very congested, hopefully soon to be really congested area, um, in a good way, um, is, is it, those are such tiny blocks that I personally think that we can probably avoid the, the, the main street itself. If you can go one block off, one way or the other, you can pepper some of these. Um, there are limitations, however, in terms of co-location for multiple providers on one small cell site. So that's, that is a limitation that exists today. I'm just, 
to, to answer your question. Um, so that's sort of how we see all of this rolling out. Again, it is exciting, but there are challenges. And the aesthetics of cities that have got in front of this and have been smart about it are, 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 are clearly large. And again, we want to be able to work with each individual city. Um, if you look at some of the things that were done in Sacramento around their redevelopment area um, and, and, and how that is all kind of wrapped into the fabric of it, I think it's a great study. Uh, San Jose recently signed a major deal um, and, and, put their, and put their master attachment agreement into play. And you know, San Jose has got a lot of complications, right? But they also have a need for technology. That's another place I would encourage staff to, to, to look. But this is literally evolving by the month. So the open dialogue, and we are committed to it. I'm, uh, you know, I, again, can't speak to the other providers, but the providers have really come together with these local communities and have figured it out on a community by community basis. And that's where some of the best resolutions, um, I think, lie. <clears throat> Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, the gentleman from Mobility, do you want to add anything to that? Come on up if you want. Come on. Come on down. Welcome to my home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie. That's good. Okay, Bill. Thank you. With a company called Mobility, uh, for this particular project, we're representing Sprint. So. We have been working with other carriers, uh, mostly in Reno. Reno's done a series of workshops, and there is, like Stephanie said, a, a, a strong desire to be a partner with cities um, to figure this all out. Uh, I think um, just dialogue and planning ahead and creating good design standards has been what we've found is the most effective way to go about it. And so yeah, I'm hoping that we can continue the dialogue here. Um, work with staff based on some of the conversations and questions we've heard today. I mean, I'd like to have a follow-up conversation with staff on what I heard today and kind of clarify some things and keep moving forward. But uh, also with the concern about the state stepping in, stepping in and um, re, you know, reducing guidelines and standards or streamlining them, the best way to um, avoid that situation is to move your policies forward and your program forward as quickly as possible so that doesn't become an issue. If your policies and procedures are in place, then you'll be in a much better position strategically if and when the state does try and, to try and step in and streamline and uh, reduce uh, restrictions and such. So that's one of my suggestions would be to continue to move forward in a timely fashion and uh, keep this momentum going for everyone's benefit. We will be, if it comes down to that, we will be asking for your help. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know what I mean when I say that, we will be asking for your help. Right. <laughs> All right, Supervisor Burton. But, well, yes. While I have you both at the table here, um, what, what I'm hearing, and you can correct me if I'm not interpreting this correctly, that in one of your primary goals is going to be a, to get the antennas in the most congested areas so that you're getting the service to the areas where people are going to be able to use it. So if we have limited number of locations in those congested areas and there's also limits to co-location, then what are you seeing in other jurisdictions if we have, say, five major carriers that are going to want to provide service and there's limitations to co-location, how are they um, coming together and, and planning that in a congested area so that you don't have an antenna every 10 feet? If I could, Stephanie Tyler again for the record, AT&T. Um, it, it just, it's just good old fashioned partnering and hard work and rolling up your sleeves and looking at creative solutions. Um, uh, I've seen some really creative solutions in downtown San Francisco in the financial district. And again, keep in mind, wireless technology is line of sight. So the, 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 the superstructure that is some of the financial buildings and, and, and all that in downtown San Francisco is extremely challenging. Um, and there's lots of, of, of different ways to skin this cat, if you will. But it really is a point of, of working very closely with staff, figuring out a process that's relatively streamlined and can move along fairly quickly, but can take into account all of the individual 
you know, uniqueness of a, of a downtown Carson City. But again, that's why I sort of made the point of maybe one of our advantages here is is the tiny, small blocks that we have in the downtown corridor um, that you could be another street off and still see the coverage that you need. But the coverage it doesn't it's it, you know it doesn't travel all that far. So it's 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 a couple of our small blocks, if you will, or major or one major city block. So you know it's 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 getting creative. And again, if you look at what was done on the Las Vegas Strip, you know, in and around some of those properties, again, very challenging areas, and boy, you want to talk about data usage, right? And that's a lot of what this is. Um, I sort of joke that I don't have to, I don't have to look at the, at the schedule for when the Bellagio fountains go off. My network can tell you, right? And, it, you know, we are, we are data user heavy in that part of the world, but as is, Sacramento and San Jose. So working with other cities, seeing what works there, pulling some of the best practices. And again, that's where I, I have to do one more pat on the back of your staff, that that's how they're looking at it. So I, I've been really impressed since I saw their engagement. And um, I think we're all here to, to work with them. Anything else that you want to add? I, I just say that with the changing technology, there's all, there was also a question about uh, staying with the most advanced technology, the the benefit of these small cell systems or or sites is that they're relatively inexpensive to deploy, and the equipment can be very you know switched out very easily as technology does advance. So you're going to see a constant moving um, technology over the over time. So another reason to support a a city that establishes a good structured program that's versatile and can move with the times in conjunction with the carriers, that's going to be to everyone's advantage as technology advances and you can switch out equipment. And the other advantage to technology advancing, there's also talk about in the future, these small antennas for small cells actually reaching a point where carriers can share sites, that's the hope, um, share antennas for by you know distributing the frequencies, separating the frequencies, that technology is not here now. But that, if that does develop, that could help uh, the concern about uh, additional sites, um, being able to move the sites uh, where they're needed. So there's just it's moving. There are a lot of moving parts here. So um, just just important to mention that as you move forward, uh, it'll, you can make adjustments, and having a good program in place will help that whole process in conjunction with the partners. Well, I'd like to thank both of the, you folks coming. I think it's, a, um, it's it's valuable for us to hear what you have to say at the ground level at the beginning of all this. So thanks for being here. And I, my hat's off to you for staying ahead of the curve in, at the local government here. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any public comments on this? Anybody want a small cell in their backyard? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Board. Stephanie, is that it? All right. Um, board, we're going to see if we can, uh, unless somebody has to take a break, let's just move on here. Then we'll, uh, we pulled 14 Bravo. Let's now, that's the Brunswick Canyon Gate. So now let's go to uh, 14 Charlie. This is uh, the storm water management plan update. <coughs> Mr. Fellows, you're going to do it. Mr. Stuckey going to be with you? Who's doing it? Yeah. Oh boy, you got the real boss here with you too. <laughs> Oh yeah, man! Protecting. Oh gosh! <laughs> I, 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 maybe I should leave. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Supervisors. It's Rob Fellows, your uh, storm drain engineer, floodplain manager, etc. Today we're going to uh, to go over the uh, the stormwater plan update and uh, go through. Uh, what is being updated and, and what new things are being presented. I do have a, an abbreviated slide presentation, but the, the main part of the, the talk addresses the, uh, the notice of intent. It's the, the larger document that's um, some 50 pages and which really goes through the, uh, the whole essence of what was, what's required in the permit and how the, the city is um, accomplishing each of those measures. Um, they divide these, um, this permit up into what they call protective measures. And uh, 
each of these things have different components and we're going to go over those and, and what, what we're doing and what we're going to do as far as an update. So as we go through this, if there's a question, let's just uh, talk about it because it, there is a lot to go over. And uh, if something comes up, let's talk about it and then uh, go on. So in your, in your packet, um, again, is the, the overall one. On the, on the screen is a, uh, I refer to as a milestone schedule. So what's interesting about Carson City and, and the people that are associated with this permit is nationwide there are six control measures, but Carson City actually has seven. The seventh one deals with Clear Creek, the Clear Creek watershed, and that, that'll be at the end. So if you start with the first control measure is public education and, out, and outreach. Um, we have a number of things that we do, and we're just going to run through them. Uh, when this program began in 2004, um, these are the, the, the things that were proposed and we were uh, continued to do from that time on. We, uh, twice a year, we have a direct mailing that goes out with the billing. Uh, we do that in January and July. Uh, we rotate, we have a number of uh, brochures. Uh, we have probably about 10. Yeah. About 10 brochures that we cycle through that deal with anything from uh, flood awareness, erosion, um, uh, maintenance, uh, ways that they can deal with uh, recognizing, uh, fertilizing their, their lawn, uh, trash, um, dealing with oil, uh, dealing with hazardous waste. There's all kinds of different things we, we cycle through that. Uh, the next one we do uh, provide worksheets to all second and fourth grade students. We've been doing this for a number of years, and we just uh, delivered a, a packet to, uh, to all the students. And with that, we, it does include some pencils. And so we just a little incentive uh, for them. Uh, one of them on the second graders deals with them recognizing some of the things that cause pollution. And they circle, and it's a little worksheet that they do. And then they can talk about why that is. Uh, the other one is a, uh, a crossword puzzle and for the fourth graders that deals with mainly uh, terminology. You know, what do these terms mean? And, and it kind of goes through some uh, definitions of terms about uh, water quality. We uh, currently have a uh, hazardous waste and uh, used oil collection program at the uh, landfill. And uh, that's been very successful. The, the amount of used oil that has been delivered goes up and down. I know a lot of uh, places like Walmart uh, collect oil as well as the auto dealerships and uh, parts stores. And so depending on the commodity and where it goes, that, that's been going up and down. But that's been successful. We, uh, a few years ago, probably about four years ago, um, started mailing um, to all the lawn care businesses in the fall about the leaves, about collecting uh, yard waste and not blowing into the street, and that they needed to take that to the landfill, and that's been working out well so far. We do have a stormwater website, and this is one thing that we've, we've tried to um, add something to the update, is uh, we, we try to push people to the website. There's a lot of good information to it on it. It's uh, carsonsw.org. There's a link from the city's website to ours and vice versa. And some of that information is on the city's website as well. But uh, we want to show an increase to our website, one of the goals, um, each year from unique visitors. And since, you know, with all the analytics from uh, Google, uh, you, we can pick that up. And it's very interesting uh, how many people from even other countries are coming and, and seeing things on, on the city's website. So interesting stuff. We work with uh, Carson Water Sub Conservancy District uh, quite a bit. They're a great partner. They have helped us so much, and they do a lot of outreach. And uh, one of our goals, which we've been doing, is to participate in at least two outreach meetings or events each year. And uh, we, we certainly do that. We're, we'll continue to do that, and we, we think of new ways of interacting with uh, the public and getting information out. 
a new thing, it's in the bottom, that we want to propose is what we're calling adopt a watershed. And um, similar to maybe adopt a street, but adopt a watershed is meant to do the outreach and uh, public participation. And it, we want to make it fun. We want to make it something that people would enjoy. It doesn't always have to be collecting trash. It could be geared toward, um, you know, uh, animal observations. You, they could do, um, uh, you know, certainly improve some things. Uh, they could do science. They could do anything that was going to help the watershed. And there's a lot of ways to do that. The next con uh, control measure is the public uh, involvement participation. And under this one, everything, as you notice, you'll, as we go through this, you'll notice that there's cross crossover. There's a lot of crossover with these um, different control measures. But in this case, um, part of that participation involvement in, involves the website. Uh, we do have a hotline. We want to try to um, increase the amount of calls that go to the hot, hotline. We're always putting that number on our brochures. We have it on our website. We actually have a card that we give to people. Uh, has the number on it, has the website. Rather than a person, we want them to go to the program and learn more about what's going on. So that's been working out for us. Uh, Rob, you, yes. you wanted questions as we went. So how many watersheds are there that could be adopted? Uh, I have 18 watersheds um, okay. within Carson City, you know, uh, currently shown, you know, from Clear Creek to Ash Canyon Creek and others, Keys Canyon. It, it wouldn't be the whole watershed, but it could be a component. Um, we, just, we just have to look at it. So it, it, it needs to be geared to the, the people who are interested in, in uh, helping it and doing something. So uh, I think there's plenty to go around. I know that a lot of people love to uh, hike and uh, use uh, VC Canyon, VC Watershed, where all the, the water is. It's constantly used by people walking their animals and um, uh, mountain bikes and, and such. So there's going to be, and I've, I've already got, actually, I've already got a few people interested in, uh, in the program. Just, we just need to figure out exactly what it's going to mean and, and uh, go from there. So the idea for, with this um, program is to have one adopted annually, and uh, that should, you know, hopefully get us, you know, 18 more years. <laughs> Let's try for more than one <laughs> per year. Let's, let's speed that up a little. <laughs> Certainly, I got two, two, uh, two, two interested so far. Um, the next control measure is the illicit discharge detection and, and elimination. Um, you know, this this is one of our bigger. Uh, ones that we pay attention to. There's a number of, of regulatory uh, things going on. You know, we we rely on our uh, storm sewer map to identify places where we in do inspections. Um, we have an ordinance that deals with people, you know, dumping uh, oils or different things into the storm drains. Uh, even uh, people cleaning carpets, we found, uh, have dumped into <coughs> storm drains. And so we have a, a mechanism to to uh, stop that and, and go through and they get a penalty and can go to court, actually. Uh, obviously, people who see uh, things that are not right need to call the hotline and, and uh, uh, let us know about those. We have, uh, we do on a, on a biannual basis monitor our dis or outfalls to the Carson River. We have three outfalls. I'm sure there's gonna be more, but Currently, we have three uh, down by the the prison farm. There's one down there. Obviously, there, there's one kind of in the center of, of town by Empire Ranch Golf Course, and uh, and then we have uh, one on the far end by um, on Morgan Mill. Yep. So just a, a thought process, and, and maybe it's more global than just storm water. But I know that you say you've got the hotline for people to do reports. My, my question really goes to, why aren't we just promoting Carson City Connect throughout everything that we do so the public has one source instead of trying to find a particular hotline or a particular website or it, it also could go through Carson City Connect 
I'm just thinking out loud that everything we're doing we're, and that has great analytics there, it, we have a lot of infrastructure already put to play. So it's just a thought as to why aren't we just really utilizing Carson City Connect. Um, since it was put into place, uh, we have been pushing that also. So that's, that's part of the, the program now. So as people get comfortable, and I know that maybe the younger folks, you know, like the app and, you know, take a picture and go through Carson Connect, that works just the same. A lot of the older folks prefer to make the phone call. So we like that too. Um, obviously, we, we go through and we do training on illicit discharge. We want uh, everyone to recognize what that is and, and um, how to, uh, you know, do cleanup and, and things like that. Um, we're, we're still going to promote the collection of oil. That's also tacked on to this program as well on this control measure. And one of our, our it's always been our goal is we, we want to update and get into um, getting our, our system map updated in our new GIS with map geo and things and so we're working hard to do that and that's a that's a constant thing that's always evolving because things are changing things are being added and uh, so we're we're working on that we believe we can get it pretty well knocked out by November of 2018 so this year uh, the next control measure is the construction site runoff control and we actually have done very well in this. Um, obviously, we want to, again, push the, um, the hotline. And here's where we, re we reference the Carson Connect. Uh, we, we do receive those. They kind of go in cycles. We get more at certain times of the year, less than others. But we, we're very prompt to, to get to the people who do use that. Um, John, jump in there. I imagine this is a good place to reference the letter to you, Rob, um, Jeanette Bloom. She made some comments in there. I assume you've uh, had contact with her and, and talked to her about some of these um, matters she brought up. Um, I was primarily struck by the uh, line, also Carson City is perhaps the worst offender in the canyon. Uh, did she explain what she meant by that? She did a little bit here, but and, She's sitting and back there, so if you have any questions, yeah. we can have her come up here. Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead, answer. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in Clear Creek. You know, we we had the um, the Clear Creek Council that we were a member of for 10 years. It's kind of gone uh, a little silent in the last few years, but. Uh, uh, over the 10 years, we had lots of things that we did, a lot of things we worked on. I know there's, you know, the old Clear Creek Road has always been an issue, and I don't know if it's ever going to be resolved, but with that old roadway uh, comes, you know, issues uh, with, with erosion and just the nature of that uh, canyon and the materials, um, you know, it, it goes to the creek. I mean, that's just the, the, the natural drainage. Um, we want to work with everybody and get some new ideas, but with with um, efforts to make changes, you got to have people and you got to have time to to do it. And so it's a matter of priorities. I know that over the the ten years that we did work in the Clear Creek with all of our partners, we we did a lot of good things. And even with the state working uh, on their issues, they've uh, done some good work with. Uh, stabilizing some of their drainage. So there's always more to do, more that you could always do. Could you also then address the uh, construction, the drive-ins, whether we have permits for those, driveways, I mean, whether there are permits for those, and uh, and the drainage of Fuji Park. Yeah, one, one of the things that's it's always a challenge when new people come in, especially with the park, is everything is, is uh, situated where the drainage is internal. It's supposed to drain towards the, the grass, and that's the way it was designed. Uh, the last couple of years, I know that maintenance folks have cut channels directly to the to the creek. That's not the way it was intended. That those need to be repaired and and continue. So what the filter is, everything goes to the park through the grass to the far basin uh, near the street, and then it runs through. And then there's a secondary basin that the water would go through before it goes back to the creek. 
so there, there are things that are in place to uh, prevent uh, or actually to kind of clean up the um, you know things that go on in the park there's also informational signs if you've noticed that through the sub conservancy and through some grant funding we've placed signs uh, talking about um, pets you know directly into the uh, the creek and things that cause the creek to you know degrade and things um, the fence the fence was put up to also help with that um, another side of the project on Fuji is that we eventually wanted to extend the riparian zone next to the creek to, to provide a buffer uh, we only got so far and then uh, interest and in funds kind of ran out but the idea is that if if you have a buffer where you can filter some of those pollutants that'll help help that environment as well so um, on the on the on the uh, subject of driveways um, people who work um, and and want a driveway have to get a permit I know that we can't always be there to to um, you know get everybody's attention that they need a permit and a contractor needs to do the work but we we do have a detail for that and um, it's very important, but you know that's kind of a code enforcement type of thing. Finally, the hope was expressed that uh, the four entities down there could get together. Is that ever a possibility in reality? You know, when we were there working with um, the Forest Service and the tribe and the state and so forth, I, I think we made good progress. I mean, even the the tribe had adopted a similar uh, plan to the city's plan. Um, you know, they do a lot of uh, testing. Uh, in fact, NDOT is doing um, continuous uh, testing on Clear Creek. So they've got a kind of a new program uh, going on at, at this point. It's just a matter of getting together and kind of sharing information. And, and uh, I think that's the biggest hurdle is finding time to get together and, and exchanging data and see, you know, see where it leads us, what, what could be done question to tag on to John's Rob. So you alluded to it somewhat, but um, is NDOT vigilant in um, dealing with the erosion that's created in and around and running off into Clear Creek based on that road system and it's not not really banked correctly in certain areas and it's created a problem. So if you could address that. Yeah. Um, it's been some time, but they, there was a study done. Uh, PBS and J did a study uh, and identified all these various uh, drainages uh, from Highway 50 to Clear Creek, and they did a priority. and They worked on the worst ones first to uh, try to stabilize, and um, in some cases even uh, install basins to to meter that water down through the canyon. And, and they've continued to work every year uh, to, to do those things. I, I think they still have a little ways to go and some of the storms and some of the things that have happened recently you know, has, has done some damage so they have to go back and do things. But they only can go so far. There's the old Clear Creek that really there's, nothing, there's a gap in there. So what NDOT has done, they've gone down to a certain distance uh, there's no one to take it from there to the creek. So that's, that's where there's a gap and that's kind of, you know, could be on tribal property, could be on private property, um, or even uh, state, state of Nevada property. So perhaps in the Adopt a Watershed program, all those partners need to adopt that area, just a thought. Yes, that'd be, that'd be a good one. Let's see what we got here. Well, it might be a good idea when they adopt it that the state go fix that road. I mean, if they're contributing to the problem, maybe I ought to ink in, step up and ink into the road for another discussion. Yes, yes, that would be right. good. That'd be good. Right. The, the next control measure deals with post-construction. So when you do um, uh, build something, you want it to work in the long term. And so th this is really dealing with um, how we um, uh, have you know, improvements last over the years and, and know that they're maintained. So one of the things that we do have an ordinance that talks about uh, if you have a facility, you have to maintain it. So we want to continue, um, obviously, to look 
and it's in, it's in there, it's one of the first ones, is to look at um, the utility, uh, the stormwater utility and the fees and keep that updated for what's uh, expected in the task for you know the city to keep up maintenance and so forth. Rob, can I just ask you a question on that? Because yeah. we talked about this a while back ago, is um, perhaps an incentive for people to do low impact development. Is, is that any part of this discussion at all? Um, I've been thinking about incentives and um, I, I think there is, I'm gonna refer to it as a credit, but there is something I, I think would be um, uh, available it, in the beginning not to actually, you know, reduce their their contribution, but in, in facilities. So if they if they did something that was more than the minimum, that that would help. They would get credit for that. That would reduce the cost of, of another requirement. So in a sense, they would get a, a credit up front. Um, as far as the utility goes, I think that's going to be an interesting discussion because once you have a credit or something that needs to be monitored, then you, you create another whole thing that has to keep track of it. And so no, I think the credit, the, and then you put it well, I think that's the idea, is that's the incentive for people to do this. Yes. And then uh, ongoing, no, there those are costs that exist, but I think that makes perfect sense. So I'm just glad you're thinking about that. Yes. Um, just kind of going down the list here, um, obviously we, we want to make sure that things are maintained that are in the ground. Um, uh, we haven't quite implemented this, this uh, initiative yet, but one of the things I was thinking of is kind of a self-reporting mechanism, maybe through the website, where they would get a reminder each year. There's only four questions, really, that, that EPA and the state wants to know is, uh, have you looked at your stormwater system? Um, if you have, does it need maintenance? And if it does need maintenance, what did you do? Did you, did you remove leaves, trash, sediment, and how much? And th those are the four things that they're interested in. So we want to try to do some, maybe some kind of a self-reporting uh, mechanism to make it easy on everybody. And then really the, the, the basis uh, uh, of the new item here is the LID standards. And that's really for each parcel to, uh, to manage the, the, the water that, the, uh, that they're generating on site. And I know that in the city, uh, not every site is suitable for like infiltration, you know, because of the groundwater and some of the, the, the soil conditions. But there, there are other filter uh, filtering things that you can do to uh, to limit it, their contribution. And if, if everyone did their part, uh, it would make an, a, a better situation as far as flooding and, and our system as it is now. So that that's that's scheduled to um, be adopted. That's the December nineteenth date, twenty nineteen is a, a board of supervisors uh, date. So that'd be like the second reading. So if that's that's the goal on that one is to get that done by then. The control measure number six is, is called Pollution Prevention Good Housekeeping for Municipal Operations. And so this control measure deals with how the city does uh, its uh, protection of the watershed and re reduction of pollutants. And uh, we want to continue to uh, to follow our procedures for good housekeeping. We have a good housekeeping manual. Um, we want to continue to, to uh, train public works and park staff on, on what is in that manual. We also have a, a integrated pest management program um, that we want to follow. What that really means is you don't always go to the extreme when you're dealing with pests. You, you have kind of a... Um, a more natural way first, and you don't always go super aggressive that may impact the, uh, the environment uh, initially. So that's a, that's a good program. We want to continue to collaborate with the Carson Water Subconservancy. Um, they, they do a lot of things with other uh, governmental agencies, and um, we, we, it's always good to work together. So the main part of the update is that we want to go back and update these these procedures and make sure it fits with what we're doing right now. I, there are a few things that are kind of update or outdated, and that's the main 
uh, change in this one is to, to update those documents and, and get them current. The last one deals with the Clear Creek uh, Master Stormwater Management Program. Um, we do have a document. Um, it's always been my contention that you know this should be no different than anywhere else in the city. I mean, this it's all part of the city, but this is a separate um, uh, control measure that they they included, and there's just a few. Um, differences and we want to put those differences into the the updated of the uh, division 14 stormwater uh, standards and it mainly deals with um, uh, a little more uh, I guess accounting for for how the water gets directly to Clear Creek they want a little more management of that and, and filtering and you know, so that, that's mainly the, the big part of that um, those are the, the seven control measures. Um, there's a lot in the other document about other things, other ways we do outreach. Uh, we can talk about any any one of those that you'd like. Any additional questions of Rob? Public comment on this? Anybody? Okay. Anything I, further, Rob? Just, just one thing. Uh, Brad Monkowski noticed some uh, some typos and things that uh, in our in our document. I've made those changes, but I just wanted to share what they what they were. Um, uh, bon, who's the the um, the Builders Association, they've they've changed their name to Nevada Builders Alliance. Um, I did make that change in there, so I've updated that in a couple of places. It it turned up in our document. Um, I had in the document uh, a reference to Carson City Development Services. It's it's actually Carson City Community Development now. So uh, I did change that. There was a couple of typos we had in there. The um, on uh, impact develop or low impact development. I was misspelled. So that's that's correct corrected now. And also there was a, a tense change on one of the paragraphs. Um, and I'll, I'll get these to the to you, so we, we fix those. We want to find out. Everybody okay? We ready for a motion? Motion's in order. Resolution number two thousand eighteen R nine. I move to approve resolution two thousand eighteen R nine with the corrections as stated. Uh, resolution adopting the Carson City Stormwater Management Plan update and acknowledging the necessity to continue to develop and implement the strategies, best management practices, control measures, corrective actions, and appropriate enforcement mechanisms needed to protect water quality and reduce the discharge of pollutants from the city's storm drainage facilities. There's a motion and a second on the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Carried. Okay. Um, board, um, you want to take a break for about five or ten minutes, or you want to? We can just push on. We're, we're okay. All right, let's push on. Let's now pick up. Um, Speak up, Jim, if you want a break. All right, all right. <laughs> let's take up item uh, 15. Uh, these are the uh, mid hardship. Uh, just 14D. 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 14, oh, I forgot about. You know, she's back there. I know. Got it. You thought I was just going to let it go. Stephanie, you want to take us up through the lease of, uh, to the United Latino community? Yes, thank you, Mr. So Mayor, for the record. 14, 14 Delta. Stephanie Hicks, Real Property Manager. The United Latino Community shared an office space with Partnership Carson City at 1711 North Roop Street, which is owned by the city. And that lease between Partnership and the city expired in August of last year. At that time, the United Latino Community also moved out of that space um, with Partnership. But since that time, they've realized that the costs of the new space they're leasing are, are that they're incurring are prohibitive. So they've asked the city if they can come back and under a new lease agreement, um, lease our building at 
1711 North Roop Street. I would like to note that um, with the assistance of Supervisor Bonkowski, we've worked to make a new and improved um, lease agreement document that we'll be using as a template as we move forward. One of the things that is new, um, particularly in this lease, uh, you know, there's, there's several, but one in particular is that we are asking for a security deposit, um, which is something new, but will help us with maintenance costs overall with the, with the building. And we have agreed in this instance to spread that cost over a 90-day period for payment so that it is manageable for, for the organization to provide to us. And I'm available if you have any questions. Questions, Stephanie? Yeah, I just want to thank you, Stephanie, and Public Works, the DA's office, Parks, um, uh, Jen. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this template. Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. It's had a lot of good language for the city to protect the city, and uh, the next step is to now categorize different templates for different uses. So that's step two that we'll be working on. So thank you for your work on that. Um, so Stephanie, one of my the issues with um, the lease on this is I, I want to clarify that I thought there was potentially a health hazard at that particular location. And so has that been resolved and everyone is satisfied that occupancy is allowed in the new? Yes, um, we, um, we have reviewed the testing report that was, it was, requested and paid for by partnership Carson City in regards to some potential mold in the building. Um, we have reviewed it. There was mold found in the janitor's closet um, that used to be um, actually a restroom and so there was a pipe that there were some issues with. The pipe has been removed. All of the materials have been replaced and repaired. That report further indicated that there was no airborne mold at all throughout the building. There was actually more mold in the testing of the air outside of the building than inside. So I have provided that report for United Latino Community to review, and I know they have representatives here today. I did ask them you know, to carefully review that and make sure they were comfortable with it as well, but that's the city's opinion of the report. And uh, I would also point out that that is part of the additional language in the lease now, that there, we've added language that, uh, that will spell out whose responsibility, remediation, and uh, responsibility for cost is for each different scenario if hazardous, hazardous materials uh, are found in the building, you know, either prior to or after occupancy and, and who brought them on. So that's now been clarified. So if it does reoccur, then it's all spelled out what happens in that situation. Other questions? Public comment? I don't see any. Board, we ready? Motions and order, Supervisor Bunkhouse. I move to approve the lease of 2,700 square feet of office space at 1711 North Roop Street to United Latino Community, a nonprofit Nevada corporation, as it will be in the best interest of Carson City, pursuant to NRS 244.284. There's a motion and a second on the motion. Discussion? And hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Carried. Okay. Um, Brad and Supervisor Bunkowski, thanks for your help on the lease issues. That is a big hug. That's pretty good. All right. <laughs> I have disclosure. I have I've, I've got one too. All right, we're now going to take up um, the uh, uh, mid matters. These are 15 <laughs> alpha through delta. Uh, I'm going to make a disclosure, and Supervisor Bunkowski has a disclosure. Let me read mine here, get electronic version up here. NRS 281A420. Um, it requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from participating when I have a disqualifying conflict. I have a partial financial interest in a property located in the downtown neighborhood improvement district. However, these related items before the board will affect all similarly situated properties in the NID. The same, no property stands to gain or lose any more than any other NID property. Therefore, under the ethics law, unless there's a disqualifying conflict, I'm required to vote. I'll be voting in this matter and don't have a disqualifying conflict in this. Uh, for the record, I would ask this dis that this uh, disclosure be applicable to all 15 Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Supervisor Bunkowski. 
Same disclosure, NRS 281A.420 requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from participating when I have a disqualifying conflict. The Nevada Commission on Ethics has opined that where a substantial and continuing business relationship exists, there is a disqualifying conflict. In my private capacity, I'm a partner in the real estate brokerage firm NAI Alliance, Carson City. NAI Alliance has listings in the NID that would qualify as a substantial and continuing business relationship. However, the these related items before the board will affect all similarly situated properties in the NID the same. No one property stands to gain or lose any more than any other NID property. Therefore, under the ethics laws, unless there is a disqualifying conflict, I am required to vote. I will be voting on this matter as I do not have a disqualifying conflict. And again, uh, for the record, this uh, disclosure applies to items 15A through 15D. All right. Let's take up, uh, Lee, you're going to work through this. Let's take up 15 Alpha. This is uh, hardship determinations uh, regarding the NID. Uh, want to go ahead and introduce this and tell us where we are. Sure. Good morning. Lee Plemmel, Community Development Director. Um, just a little bit of an overview. These are the, the four items on the agenda, 15 Alpha through Delta, are to uh, implement the annual uh, downtown Neighborhood Improvement District, also referred to as the NID, NID. Um, this was initiated by the Board of Supervisors by resolution on April 19th. We've provided the required publication in the newspaper uh, three times, sent out notices to all the property owners in compliance with NRS 271 and, and per NRS. These are the these are the steps we need to take uh, today to implement and levy the assessment for, for the next fiscal year, which includes the first item on the agenda, hardship determinations. We'll have a public hearing, open up an uh, item that's just specifically for a public hearing to hear protest, um, a resolution, and an ordinance confirming the, res the, the, uh, the assessment. So regarding the hardship determination, we've received none. So. Um, you, you'll actually take no action on, you don't need to take any action on this item, but I just do want to note just for the public or anybody from the downtown watching to make sure nobody thinks they've missed out on anything, this this does apply. Qualified people are those that earn 50% or less of the area's median income. However, this waiver is not a, a waiver from having to pay the assessment. It's only a deferment of the assessment, which means you still have to pay it. And per the provisions of NRS, you have to pay interest in the end. So those that can pay it are better off paying it now. And, and again, we've received no, no uh, hardship determination uh, applications for, for item 15AA. All right, public comment, anybody? Board, anybody? I don't see any, no actions required on this. All right, let's take up item uh, 15, Bravo, then we'll open a public hearing uh, uh, to take public comment regarding the filing of the fiscal year 2019 assessment role for the downtown neighborhood improvement district to consider written objections concerning that area to be assessed and to consider all complaints, protests, and objections to the assessment pursuant to NRS 271.385. Uh, the public hearing is now open. Uh, you want to just let lay the groundwork and then we'll, I don't see anybody here, but lay the groundwork and see where we are. Okay. Sure, just very briefly, uh, consistent with what was presented to the Board of Supervisors in April and this, uh, this information was all sent out to all the property owners as well. I included the spreadsheet in the, in the property owner notices. Highlighted up there is the assessment for this fiscal year. The table there is just a five-year estimate of the, of the revenues and expenditures, making some assumptions, but uh, so that's an estimate of of, again, revenues and expenditures for the next five years. Highlighted there is the assessment for FY19 would be 51,846 distributed among the property owners per the ordinance creating it. Uh, the city is putting in its contribution of 26,472 into the pot as well for, for maintenance next year. Okay, this is a public hearing. Anybody? I don't Stand. General. Man, I got a colonel over there and I got a general coming up. Man, I don't know. Looks like us poor old captains are on the tail end again. And you're in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, Stan Jones, uh, I'm, a, I'm not a property owner. I'm a business owner within the NID district. 
And I would make a suggestion that when we put these uh, notices out, that they also go to the businesses. My property owner is an absentee owner, and I've only talked to him once in the last five years. And so I don't get anything that's sent direct to the property owner. I think it's necessary to notify the businesses too. All right. Somehow I thought we were doing that, but that's a good point. Good. The assessment goes to the property owner, and so per all the per all the legal requirements, it's it's the property owner. But we can I'll, I'll make a note in the if unless there, the, unless there's any dissenting, we, the I don't, is, we, we, we can send, send it to the yeah. to the businesses downtown as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, General. By the way, if anybody wants to know, he really is a general. <laughs> He's a retired general. Guard, National Guard. All right. Any other public comment? I see some folks walking in. This is on the Neighborhood Improvement District. Let me ask a question while we've got public hearing here. How's the, how's the, how is the Neighborhood Improvement District process working out in terms of keeping the, you know, everybody doing their respective duties, complying with their respective duties to keep things clean? There's been ongoing dialogue between the the the, the downtown NID board, the contractor, um, public works, parks and rec. I think we're still working things out. We've really only had, I think, one full contract year now of maintenance and that. So I think it's been a learning experience. We still are trying to set up meetings uh, with parks and rec and, and the NID board and the contractor to talk about uh, some of the issues that have come up, how frequently they're cleaning and those types of things. I think ge generally, I think it's been uh, pretty good. Uh, the, the NID board members, the downtown NID board members are proactive. They've taken, really taken over, taken control of it, which from our side I think is good. And um, we're just in communication where there's little problems here and there. Um, and again, I just want to remind you that when they meet, everyone should be noticed in the NID. Yeah, and, and they and they set it up themselves, so I'll need to be in communication with Jenny LaPiccolo, the uh, whatever whatever the, the chair, the, she's the chair, um, to make sure she informs me so that we can get those to her, but I'll, I'll do that. John. Yeah, I wish I could agree with you, Lee, but I don't think that it, the first year went as well as I like would have liked to have seen. I've already referenced this in a previous um, meeting and I'd like to see it stepped up because at downtown we spent a lot of money on it we need to keep it clean yeah and I think that so the level of service is based on the amount of money that that's being being put into this so I think part part of the plan now is to make sure there is enough money in there to up that level a bit and I think that's part of the discussions that we'll be having with them thank you but requires me to comment if they took the job they're supposed to do it the money can go up or go down but they can get a new contract if they need it but but what I'm saying is the contract has a specific level of surface of what of their performance so I think they you know I think they fulfilled their contract this year which in this case is power wash you know for example and I'm not even sure this is but I believe power washing the sidewalks twice a year now it's that that's what they bid on, that's what they did. So that, so I don't want it to be out there like they're not fulfilling what their contract is, um, but we need to discuss how it's done to, so to make sure they're doing it to what the level that you're looking for, I think. Yeah. At some point in time, we might want to have the NID board or president of the NID board come in and just give us an update on where they think they are. All right, are we ready to close the public hearing on this matter? All right, unless there's any further <coughs> comments, uh, anybody? Then we're gonna close the public hearing on, on 15 Bravo. We'll take up 15 Charlie. Uh, we don't have any things to deal with on this one, so is there an action required with on? Uh, you wanna take up 15? So, so this, this item is to, uh, to adopt a resolution uh, that dispenses with all complaints, protests, and ratifies the assessment role. Um, the following item after this one is going to be introducing the ordinance to, to levy the assessment role. All right, so we need a resolution on this one. To, okay. A public comment on this? I think we know. Uh, we're ready for a motion. Go yeah. ahead. Go. I move to adopt resolution 2018 R10. 
confirming the downtown neighborhood improvement district assessment, dispensing with complaints, protests, and objections to the assessment, and ratifying the city engineer's assessment role for fiscal year 2019 for the downtown NID for the maintenance of the downtown streetscape enhancement project. Second. There's a motion and a second on the motion discussion. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay, carried. Okay, let's now take up the last item here. This is 15 Delta. This is the actual ordinance related to the NID. Um, we have to have introduce and adopt the ordinance to levy the assessment. Uh, we've already talked about it. Public comment on this issue? Board comments? I think we know where we are. Motion's in order. I'll make it. What's the bill number? 107. I move to introduce on first reading Bill Number 107, an ordinance related to improvement districts establishing provisions to levy the Downtown Neighborhood Improvement District Assessment for fiscal year 2019 for the maintenance of the Downtown street Streetscape Enhancement Project. Second. There's a motion and a second on the motion discussion. Hearing none, all in favor, signal vote saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay, carried. Okay, let's take up item 15, ECHO. This is uh, marijuana signages. Uh, I have a disclosure here as well. NRS 281A.420 <laughs> requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from participating when I have a disqualifying conflict. In my private capacity, I'm of counsel for the law firm of Kemfer Kroll. Although I'm retired, I do maintain an office in the firm. The firm has offices in Reno and Las Vegas. None of the attorneys in the Carson City office represent Carson City marijuana establishments. Furthermore, the, before the matter before the board will affect all marijuana businesses the same. No one entity stands to gain or lose any more than any other. Therefore, under the ethics law, unless there's a disqualifying interest, I'm required to vote. I'll be voting on this matter as I don't have a disqualifying conflict. Those, by the way, those dis uh, conflicts were written to us by our district attorney. Okay, go. NRS 281A.420 requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from participating when I have a disqualifying conflict. In my private capacity, I am a partner in the real estate brokerage firm NAI Alliance Carson City. NAI has in the past and may in the future represent clients that are looking for space for marijuana businesses in Carson City. However, none of the brokers in my office are currently doing this in Carson City. So, Mr. DA, uh, we do we are representing some groups in Lyon County. I assume that that's not a conflict. Correct. Okay. Since no substantial and continuing business relationships exist in Carson City, requiring my abstention and the possibility that there may be such a client in the future is speculative. My public duty is to vote absent a clear conflict of interest. Furthermore, our decision here today on this item will affect all marijuana businesses the same. No one entity stands to gain or lose any more than any other. Therefore, I will be voting on this matter. Any other disclosures? I don't see any. Okay. Where are we on this, Lee? We've been, had it a couple of times. Thank you. Yes, we've had this has been this matter has been before the board uh, twice now, um, going through first, second reading, and based on some discussions coming back now uh, for first reading, actually back to the verbiage that was originally in there. Um, but just to go over it, this is, this is an ordinance that's uh, we're doing these three things, which is. Moving the sign stand rather than referencing them elsewhere in the code and the sign standards is actually putting them in with the marijuana dispensary and uh, the marijuana establishment code ordinances, making some clarifications uh, within there. Um, and the standards are the same as they were originally, except that the only addition is rather for the dispensaries and retail stores, rather than allowing 15 square feet per. Um, Per frontage, uh, that's just changed to 30 feet total, regardless of regardless of building frontage. Which the actual result will be that one of one of our two permitted stores will be able to increase their sign area from 15 feet to 30 30 feet. That's really the only effect of of any change to this ordinance. And the planning commission vote on this. And the and the planning commission recommended by a vote of five to one to adopt the ordinance as it is, as it appears t before you today. Well, the, comment. The, the second location could decide to eliminate one frontage and do 30. So it, 
it's fair or the same for both locations. Okay. Public comment on this issue? Anybody? <clears throat> I don't see any board discussion. Motion's in order. Bill number 108. I move to introduce on first reading Bill number 108, an ordinance related to marijuana amending Title 18 zoning, Appendix A development standards, Division 1.20 medical marijuana establishments and marijuana establishments of the Carson City Municipal Code to amend and clarify regulations governing signage for medical marijuana establishments and marijuana establishments. Okay. There's a motion to second discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Carried. Okay. Let's take up the last one under item 15. This is 15 Foxtrot. Uh, this is to provide direction to staff regarding possible sign ordinance changes related to temporary banners, flags, A frame signs, and other temporary sign devices for commercial advertising. Mr. Plummel. Okay, good morning again. I apologize for having to continue this a couple times, being, being absent <coughs> from. I know you've been anxious to talk about. Uh, feather flags and A-frame signs, um, but uh, um, but seriously, there are a couple of things. And so I've had some discussions with uh, Lori. I've I've talked to businesses now that we're coming into the season again, asking about how the signs relate, particularly with uh, A-frame signs, how they relate to downtown and other other areas of the commercial corridors. And also what's come up is these feather flags. So I have some examples in there. You, you've seen some pictures in your packets. I could show them if, if you want to look at anything up there. But the, the basic thing about that is, is that those didn't exist when the sign code was written in 2002. They're, I don't know that they're, I wouldn't call them a new product now, but they weren't, they were, they weren't contemplated in 2002. Um, and so at the board's direction and what you think of these things. I think my my recommendation uh, for at least to start the conversation would be to add those types of flags as being permitted, um, subject subject to limitations, which we'd go to the planning commission and come up with those. You know, size, time limitations, similar to banners, um, but allow those. And also, what I did, what I don't have in the staff report, but has come up since I finished the staff report regarding A-frame signs. So I note in there that, and I have some examples and, and up there that, you know, the A-frame signs, the reason they are permitted downtown and not elsewhere is that they are pedestrian oriented downtown. They're limited to 36 inches in height, 32 inches wide, um, which at slow speeds and when they're out by the sidewalk on a car, you can see them and read them, but they are generally intended to be pedestrian oriented probably not good and not big enough and intended to be used on South Carson Street, for example, where the speeds are higher, wider corridors. So you generally don't want those types of things lined up along the sidewalk. However, kind of in the spirit of fairness and really what's not the issue is having A-frame signs within a strip mall if they're up against the building or you know near the frontage where they are pedestrian oriented. That's actually not an issue in terms of any safety hazards or anything. So my second recommendation up there for discussion would be to just allow A-frame signs everywhere and not just downtown, but include some limitations that keeps them against the, against the buildings where they're like, whether they're downtown or elsewhere, so that everybody has a level playing field. And I think it addresses my initial concerns talking about as a, as a traffic distraction generally and just just the appearance of them. So I've, the, this, again, uh, Supervisor Bagwell asked me to bring this forward. Um, we've had some, some businesses, and I don't see anybody here, but um, you know, I've, I've talked to some of the businesses, told them we were gonna be discussing this. And actually at this, at this time too, I wanna point out, we have our, our two new code enforcement officers that have come on this year on the left. On your left, William Kobarger, Bill, and Jason Johnson, Johnston. Um, so they're they're the new ones. We're we're um, they're just getting up to speed on all the code enforcement issues. Um, we're going to be starting a sign enforcement program soon. So this will be their first time going out. Um, we I laid out all the different sign temporary sign codes on the table we've done some training on it there's a, there's a lot to it so we're going to start on it so the, and in, in the photos you have not going to say everything that out, that out, that's out there is legal but we're going to 
they're, they're ex <laughs> they're, they are examples of what people want to do, so just know that you know you may be getting some calls uh, soon on why they're having to take away their little a frame or their little signs and, uh, out from in front of the streets and things but we'll be we'll be starting a sign enforcement program soon uh, if you have any questions. Thank you for bringing that up because code enforcement was going to be my first question um, because there's a lot of things that go out there that end up being permanent and um, there's a lot of feather flags that are tattered and look terrible but the other is more about visual impairment visual clutter and um, distracted driving. So I'm wondering if on the feather flags, I understand for sales and for things of that nature, you know, people need to, you know, acknowledge that they've got this going on in their business. But I really feel that they can't be out at the roadway. They've got to be next to the business operation because otherwise it does impede, um, it, it creates distracted driving. We have issues with pedestrians getting hit. I don't like that. And this this is just one more visual distraction that creates a problem. So um, I am concerned about that. Uh, so I wanted to clarify something, Lee. Um, your recommendation number two, do not allow portable A-frame signs outside the downtown mixed-use zoning district. But I thought I just heard you say that you're considering allowing the A-frame signs, uh, A-frame signs within a strip mall on the immediately adjacent sidewalk. Yes. Yes. That yes. Not on the that, street. Not on the sidewalk. On the that's right, and I, yeah, as I tried to, yeah, since writing this and understanding what, where, I, where the businesses were, I was thinking fully about the A-frame signs lining the highway corridors, um, not really thinking, as was pointed out to me, about the strip malls, which aren't a problem. So I would just suggest that we have, uh, allow them everywhere, but that um, they have to be located within a certain distance of the front door of the business or something like that. Do you anticipate that that could become a compliance um, issue? All of these are <laughs> compliance right. issues yes. in terms of right. in terms so of are, having are we, to go are we out contributing. And it. But actually, but actually, no. In terms of, I mean, I think that's the easy. Actually, these these thirty days within any ninety day is the hardest thing to enforce. I think it's appropriate. We come up with a plan and we do our best to go monthly and check. And um, you know, I think you you can reasonably manage those, but. If uh, allowing them all the time and within a certain distance is easy, they are either where they should be or they shouldn't. It's not not a matter of coming back later in the time. It's move it to where it's supposed to be, or you have too many, and and it's at any given point in time you could tell it's either in compliance or not in compliance. Versus these time limits, and then you have you have to go back 30 days later. Right or appropriate size. Yeah, and size and everything. Right. Yeah. So so let me circle back to that. Um, I'm okay with recommendation number three. On recommendation number one, I'd like to go through some concerns of mine. If you go to 4.4.7 exemptions and the language that you have in here, uh, it starts with S. Banners located on private property providing such devices are not used for a period in excess of 30 consecutive days in any 90-day period. The following standards apply. What I'd like to do is simplify uh, the ability for us to enforce this and one of the issues that that has been a problem in the past is where businesses will just change out the temporary banner every 30 days which then starts the 90-day clock right. no it should be one banner I mean you only get to have a banner for 30 days after which you can't have a banner anymore so what pe again what people have been doing in the last few months is without enforcement going out but you know this gap between Kevin retiring, Kelly leaving last year, and, and having new, new officers going out and checking. So the way it's written, they can't, it's not a matter, it's not that banner, that sheet of plastic, it's having one up or not. Yeah, I'm not sure that in reality that's been taking place. So I have some suggested language changes that hopefully will make it easier for us to enforce this under item one under S. Uh, if we change that so that it read one banner per building is allowed 
and delete everything else mm -hmm. in that line. Then going down to number four, um, we could potentially delete item four in its entirety. And then going down to T, the language could be changed so it reads, changeable promotional flags located on private property provided such flags are not used for a period in excess of 30 consecutive days within a 90 day period. Delete the final sentence. And or you could keep it in excess of any 30 day consecutive period with any 90 day period subject to the following standards. So delete any flag maintained in excess of 30 days. So I think, I think that can be re reworded, but the purpose of that and those other standards, I think you still want to allow people to have the flags that are up against the building, which are the more decorative. They're not to attract attention, but the, that, that exception is that people can have the flags attached to the building, right. which I don't, which hasn't been an issue. And I think we want to keep that provision. I think it could be reworded. Yeah. And I'm not talking stuff. about removing that provision, okay. just cleaning it up yeah. so that it's clear that it's 30 consecutive days in a 90 day period. And it's only on one frontage and only one flag per building. So number one would be changed to one flag per building period of delete elevation a maximum of two flags per site. So that I think cleans up a lot of the language so that they can only have one banner per building site and it's 30 days in a 90 day period. End of story. Okay. It seems to me that that would be uh, easier for our compliance officer. So I'm putting that on the table for everybody else here to discuss. Could I ask a question I, yeah, about I need that? Yeah, clarification of a well, building. Yeah, we got a couple yeah. questions yeah. here. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know whose light was on first on the. Well, well I didn't put. A, well, my light was. It doesn't matter. I'm asking so, Brad a question. She, which no, is, go ahead and talk and ask. That's fine. Let's go. Yeah, go uh, one building, five businesses. Yeah. It's per business. Address. Yeah, I think it, it should be. It should say business there if you're going to. Yeah, which we can clarify. That. What I'm trying to avoid, like if it's a corner, if it's an end cap, they have two building frontages. I want to make clear they can only have one banner, not not one per frontage. I can I can live with per business as so long as it's business, because like you look at the new 308 Curry, there might have ten businesses in there. So, okay, I can live with it as ten business. Flags. Ten flags. Ten flags. But I do want to uh, thank you for bringing this forward and the clarification on the um, A-frame sign. So I did bring this because I had a bunch of constituents that were complaining about um, inconsistent code enforcement and, under, and their ability to even understand what the compliance really is. And so I think the misunderstanding was that um, people thought I was talking about on the street side signage, and it was not. It is about the ability to put your sale item in any walkable area in Carson City that is a mall environment that they need to put their sign up equally as well as anyone in the mixed use. So, um, yeah, so that that's really why I was bringing this forward for clarification was we have a bunch of people out of compliance that have their little A-frame that says, my special today is, whatever, Chorizo eggs or for twelve ninety five, And so I just wanted consistency, and that's going to help code enforcement, I think. Uh, John, that. John, did I? Well, I promised earlier I would probably say something stupid about this, and now I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. I know every businessman in town, I am pro-business to start with, but I know every businessman in town will be uh, mad at me when I say uh, this is a junky look and it's been a junky look in Carson City and other cities for a long time. I wish we wouldn't do any of this, so I will go along with the majority here, but the truth of the matter is we just spent, we're spending 15 to 20 million on our downtown to make it work better. And now we're gonna take it out to the malls. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Flapping flags and big signs on buildings don't really help the businesses that much in my view. There's the stupid thing. Um, I, 
we'll, I, we'll get to public comment in a minute. Don't worry. We'll, I agree with John's assessment of the visual clutter. I hate it as well. And I don't know that it <laughs> essentially works for any purpose, but I understand people want to get their message out there, and I do understand that part. The other thing that I want to talk about is um, business signage that is banner signage that ends up being permanent signage, and there's no enforcement of that. That's got to be addressed as well. It hasn't been, and the whole idea behind giving a regulation for, uh, for permanent signage was that these businesses don't look temporary. So that's got to be enforced also. Plus, there's a cost to enforcement, and we don't charge anything for the, what they're doing. And they, they don't follow the comply, they don't apply most of the time. Signs. At least I think we've got the ones where they're just plastered all over the wall. Are those still up? I mean, those are the big visual clutter to me. I mean, where you drive down and they got, oh, instead of a storefront, they've got a sign front. I mean, that's all it is. It's one sign here, Budweiser that, yeah. Coors that, whatever. <laughs> anyway, I, John, I, I don't think it was what you're, you know, I. You know, I'm as. It's only stupid politically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, shut up then. That's fine. That's good. All right. Uh, any other board comments before I go to public comment? And I want to introduce our, our two code enforcement officers in a minute. Public comment. Stan, come on up. Did you bring your feather sign with you? <laughs> just I know. I just go by your place. I got to figure out what you got up there. For the record, Stan Jones. Just a little background. I was on the RAC committee, God knows how long ago, when Robin Williamson was supervisor. And we originally were discussing the master plan, and part of it was signage. And an old gentleman who I had a lot of respect for, Art Hannafin, came to us and said, if you want to look like Tijuana, start allowing sidewalk signs. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, I, I need some clarification here. Are we going to allow A-frame signs in front of all the strip malls? Are, are you talking about next to the buildings, or are you talking about on the sidewalk? Next, next to the buildings on a bus per business. Next to the building, not on. The, not okay, next so to we're the not changing the existing no statute. No. That's my understanding. I mean, we're going to clarify all this, but that's okay. my understanding. I would do an A frame one. That's what's under discussion right now is an A frame next to your next to the building, one or within business. or within six feet. I think it says whatever six feet. the door, yeah. whatever right. that says. Yeah. I would suggest that you might add one thing. You have an A frame or a flag. Yes. One. You get one. Well, I, you don't say that now. I mean. Is that, I mean, is that implied, either an a, a flag or an A-frame? Um, so I think it depends on how it sh turns out we allow flags. I mean, I've heard flags should be back up against the building, but um, I, I think the, the intent of this was to allow, to allow the flags to be out on the property, but closer to the street, not within a certain distance which means you could still have an A-frame sign back by your building and have a flag out front temporarily, but the, but the flag's limited in time. That's, so that's, I think, where the recommendation lies right now. No, that's not where we're my going. Prob my, prob business. my problem is temporary becomes permanent. Uh, hang on, so we, we, we gotta make it. I can add one at We just gotta, so we pick this up for the record here. Okay, my understanding is from listening to the debate up here is that you know, it's one feather flag or A-frame next to the building within a certain f number of feet from a business door, but, and that, that's what they're talking about. Now, General Stan, what were you talking about there? Well, I mean, so, so you know. And I got your Tijuana argument, yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about, like, on Main Street, you're allowed one sign per business. Sorry. On Main Street, you're allowed one sign per business. Uh, the strip malls, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I'm just kind of in a quandary. I'd rather not get involved in that, I guess. But the, the big problem, we've got a great ordinance. We really, truly do. We've never enforced it. 
and I'm not criticizing these guys, I know they're new on board, but there's no use at doing anything until we start enforcing what we have. And we have a great statute. And we have the same offenders. You can drive down this main street or on Highway 50 and it's the same offenders all the time. And I think, well, you got to put some teeth in it. And I'm, I'm not telling you how to do that. I'm just saying we have to put some teeth in it. Well, as I understand it, we're not making no big of a change except for feather flags, which be picked up. I mean, we do, because we haven't talked about right. feather flags. Right. And on the A-frame signs, it would essentially be the same as the downtown area throughout. Right. And next to the business. So you wouldn't be having that clutter that we're talking about. At least, theoretically, you wouldn't have that density of a clutter. But uh, that, that's my understanding of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or is there further ones than that one? Further. Yeah, you yeah, I further. definitely need to clarify because this is not what I was trying to relay. Okay. I, I don't support any feather signs at all. Zero. Oh. So I'm talking about, I that's can That's a feather in your cap. There you go. <laughs> I, I was speaking to the temporary banners, uh, A-frame signs, you know, I want to think about that. Um, and then the portable, yeah, it, I think that, that when you drive down our commercial corridors, that all the little stick signs that they put out by the road, those need to be pulled up and thrown away. The feather signs, they need to be gone. One sign, one banner per business address, and that's it, other than their signage on the building. That's what I support. So I'm sorry that I didn't make that clear to the other four of you. I'm, st I'm not understanding. So are you say so why don't we this do what John said? Absolutely no outside signs. H how do you have, con I mean, why not? I'm no not outside sure. signs? I'm not sure that's what I said. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm I trying to get what you mean by a banner if a banner's not a flag. Yeah, the banner's not. It's not. Oh, this is so I need to understand what you mean by banner. 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 It's, that's in the code. So you mean only attached, attached to the building? building? Banner Correct. Attached, yeah. So no freestand. Why did no why? No freestanding. Then I want flags. to do that in the mixed use area also. No freestanding. I just want consistency for the businesses. If I can walk on Third Plaza, what's the difference there than the Carson Mall? Larry, you're not going to have to convince me. Okay, that's what I just said. I want consistency and fairness because then code enforcement's going to apply the same rule throughout the entire community. That's that's how we're going to get enforcement. That's how we're going to get all the businesses in town saying, "Well, wait a minute. I thought I could. No, he can, but I can't." So I will support anything that gives us equivalent consistency. And so what you're saying is only a 30-day banner attached to the building within a 90-day period? Or a, is what? or a sandwich board. I, I thought no sandwich boards. Sandwich boards. I, I didn't make any comment on the sandwich boards. I said I wanted to think about that some more. So I'm willing to participate in that discussion. But what I'm saying is that we need to clean up the feather signs, the flag, freestanding flags, and all the little signs that people put out on the little metal sticks, and you go by a property and there's 20 of them along the frontage. That stuff, it needs to be very simple. If you see it, get rid of it. Let me ask a question. On the feather flags for a one-day event. I'm sorry. Go. I'm perfectly willing. Feather flags for one-day event, as in the wine walk. I mean, that... Is that allowed or not? A special event. We just have to be consistent in what we do. That's all. Yeah. So I think um, we have some pretty good guidance and direction. So we're going to have, this is obviously going to the Planning Commission for recommendations. I'll continue to talk to the businesses. Um, to let them know the process so there'll be more public participation in developing it. The Planning Commission is going to come up with recommendations relating to banners, flags, and A-frame signs based on this discussion, and, and it'll come back to you. Um, so I don't, I don't think you need to feel like you need to work out every detail now, because I think there's a lot of discussion to continue. But I think you can get a sense of where yeah. we are. I mean, yeah. I, I think at the end of the, there, there's a couple guiding, one guiding principles. We want a consistency so, so nobody feels right. out. Two, we want the clutter reduced. 
and and if that means just clutter reduced so and that there's a there's a substantial amount of discussion about whether or not feather flags should be allowed at all and they can talk about that whether it should be special use on a one day only or one weekend only or whatever but that that's the the kind of the where, where we're coming from as a board well i have a couple more questions so. sure go all right um feather flags don't include these um blowing in the wind figures that are put out or do they there's actually a category called inflatable in, inflatable devices that covers those that also have time limits and size limitations. I'd, just speaking for myself, I'd love to get rid of them. They are the most inane. If everybody was as good as this business owner at following the law and taking it uh, to the extreme that he can, but living within it and not complaining and saying we shouldn't look like Tijuana, I wouldn't have these concerns, but not every business person is like the one sitting in front of us. Yeah, I, I agree with John. I would I support eliminating the inflatables, um, but then that also brings to mind some of the displays that the auto dealers use, like the, the balloons and flags, and so what do those fall under? So the, the auto dealers have a, have a different section that allows those specifically for, for auto dealers. Um, so we're not consistent. To f need to fix it. So what happens if you have uh, somebody who puts up uh, 10 United States of America flags in front of their business? <laughs> it's the test portion of the <laughs> questioning. Ten, th there's a, yeah, well, well without I think, having you know, it, I mean, there, there are American, American flags are exempt. There's some uh, there's other exemptions for official right. flags. Well, I think, you know, we, we're not going to solve it all yeah. here, but I think what you need to take back to the Planning Commission, what's your drafting yeah. ordinance. I mean, I, I, th I think what you're hearing is we need to s squeeze down on s some of this stuff, uh, make it uniform. And personally, I can go along with what they're saying here. You know, I, I just as soon not see the feather flags and the inflatable guys and people and all that stuff. But, but you know, I'm... I don't have a business down there either, so. Uh, I still have a couple more questions, sure, and, and no. that is how much does it cost for us to enforce the sign ordinance that we're not enforcing? No, we, we haven't tracked time, but with co enforced compliance officers. That's uh, not all these guys do, right? Right, okay. right. I mean, it, so, it, but, you know, well, nuisances, garbage, weeds, and all the other I stuff. I think the witness's uh, suggestion that we put some teeth into this makes some sense to me. If we're going to have offenders, they're going to pay a price for it, and they're going to help then fund the people that we have to send out to do this. That's just a suggestion that somebody ought to think about. I think right about now the city manager is glad that he's not going to be here next week, <laughs> <laughs> two weeks from now. Maybe we ought to punish you and have them come back in. Anyway. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not leaving. I, I do believe there's a lot of business. I, just because we hear it from both sides. I mean, you know, as a, as a planner, I certainly appreciate your uh, your desire to have these clean commercial corridors that are attractive to businesses and visitors, but. From being the person that gets the call from the businesses, I can assure you, you're gonna. When we, when we tell them they can't have their inflatable devices and things, you're you're gonna hear from them. So if the, I, it'll that's be why that's why they pay us the big bucks. Yeah. It'll, so we'll go through the process and and get some recommendations from the planning commission. And I, I think the issue for me, um, the. And I owned a retail business in Carson City for 16 years. Uh, the, the limits are always going to be pushed, no matter what we do. So taking that into consideration, I'd rather set the limits very strictly, which I think makes it easier for us as far as compliance. But I guarantee you that no matter where we set that bar, the businesses are going to complain and want more and try to figure out how to cut every corner. 
So, I mean, they can come talk to me, and that's what I'm going to tell them. It's like, look, we gave you a chance. We gave you extra signage during the recession, and it totally got thrown back into our face because it became an entitlement. You didn't even say thank you. You just said you can't take it away now. And so I think that we've given the business community the opportunity, and they've abused it. Amen. Uh, my, I guess I just, on behalf of the businesses, and many of us were in business, to assume you don't need signage or that signage does not produce more business for you, we shouldn't be naive about that either. So depending on where you are, so a great example is, didn't we just do something to allow Western Nevada College to put a sign nowhere near their facility? Because they need... I'm saying that there is issues that you really can't say no signs, <coughs> depending on the type of business and where they're setbacks and all malls are not created equal. And maybe you're the business in the far back corner that no one would even know you existed without a sign. So I'm okay with consistency, looking to limiting maybe one per building and talking about it. But just just don't want to be so naive to think that a business doesn't need its sign. Okay. We're going to... Planning Commission's got the work cut out mm -hmm. for them. Uh, you know, th these are not easy issues, but, you know, see, see what they come up with. I mean, uh, all right. General, anything further? No, sir. Uh, just briefly, I'd like to publicly thank Nick for all of his service and his friendship, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stan. Here. Likewise. Thank you, board. You bet. All right, Stan. All right, before we go on to the next one, can we have our two code enforcement officers? Come on up and sit down. And come on up. Just come on. <coughs> We're not going to rag on you. Just... Uh, <laughs> Why don't you just uh, tell us, you know, who you are, where you've been, and just briefly, and then, you know, what you're seeing out there. No big deal. I'm just to introduce everybody so we know, who, you know. All right. Go ahead. Um, my name is Jason Johnston. Just just yeah. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, Jason Johnston. Uh, just started with code enforcement back in January. Um, came from as a federal police officer for a while, also a reserve deputy with the Carson City Sheriff's Office. Local, been around Carson City, Douglas County area for about 25 years now. Uh, code enforcement, it's been very interesting, gives me a very different perspective on the community. We stay very busy. We kind of taken a different approach to it, more friendly approach, working with the citizens, really enjoy that aspect. So we also stay very busy. Okay. Yes, sir. Bill Kobarger. Uh, I've been in the uh, state since August of 2000. Uh, started as a city manager in Carlin and then went to be the city manager in Pahrump. Before that, I was a city manager in Ohio. Um, and so you've, the, you've been, you, as I say, you've been around. Yes, sir. I was a law enforcement officer in Ohio, too, for right. numerous years. Uh, and I've already caused uh, Nick uh, some gray hair, so I probably shouldn't say anything more. Uh, he doesn't have any hair anyway. All so. good. Uh, no, um, code enforcement is unique. Um, no matter what we do, we kind of get uh, blindsided or told that we're not enforcing the code properly. Uh, Especially when the sign thing is, it's interesting, you know, 30 days on, 90, 60 days off, which is, is somewhat confusing at times, uh, especially because we have to track uh, 4,600 businesses uh, in this community. And in the, since uh, February 1 or February 15th, uh, Jason and I have actually personally visited over 300 businesses in this community for business licensing ex uh, expiration because their uh, license expired. We've shaken hands, we've talked to a lot of people. And we keep hearing the same thing. Wow, we didn't know code enforcement actually existed. We thought you guys would just go, so it's nice seeing you out shaking hands and saying hi, even though he's getting phone calls on it, <laughs> which then he gets phone calls on, and then we get talked to. <laughs> but uh, it's an uh, interesting business because of what we do. Um, you know, not right sometimes and not right other times. But it's fun. It's interesting, and uh, we enjoy the job, and thank you. Okay. 
very good guys. All right, thanks for coming on up. And <laughs> so we, all right, uh, it would be done here in a second, I think. Hang on a second. We're about done because. Do you have enough direction? Do we need an? I don't think we need a motion on that, right? Yeah. We don't need motion. Motions in order, then. So. No, we don't. Need no, we don't. We don't need a motion. Need That's right. All right. Uh, we're done with the morning business, then. City man. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. It's a break. You have the city manager update, but John. Yeah. I'll be yeah. right back. You can start. All right. Uh, you, you okay, John? If we start. Sure. I've already read this. City manager, who's gonna who's gonna do it? Oh, go. Hey, let, let me do a favor here. I've got to go give that. Uh, Karen, can I give you the gavel sure. for right now? Before I, before I go, Ann, <coughs> Ann Knowles, I uh, don't mean to put you on the spot, but is there, is, do we have a date for the Memorial Day ceremony, or time for the Memorial Day ceremony at, the, at our, at our uh, uh, cemetery? Do you know anything about that? Okay. Four o'clock on Fridays, putting out all the flags. So, but so when, when's the actual ceremony? On Monday, I don't know. I had the four o'clock on Friday. We're putting all the flags out. All right. On the. All right. I I have to go to. I've got a noon noon presentation to make. Uh, so Karen, can I give you the gavel? Mm -hmm. And then uh, please excuse me. I'm going to turn the gavel over to Karen, and I'll be back for the afternoon one. So, Karen, there. Okay. okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Go ahead, Nancy. All right, so with upcoming events on May 21st, we have a special meeting of the board to adopt the city's fiscal year 19 final budget. And then the Freedom Monument Project is complete and the dedication ceremony will be on June 14th at 12 p.m. And that's a picture of the actual site, the completed site. And I will not be here for that, I'll be gone, so. Oh, okay. I just want to add on that one for everyone. That is Flag Day. And so we have a group of uh, children and DAR that will come and distribute flags for everyone that wants to come because it's also Flag Day. All right. Okay, so Public Works staff is working with Federal Highways and NDOT to execute the Tiger Grant Agreement for $7.5 Also related to this project, the relinquishment of South Carson Street from NDOT to the city is anticipated to be complete by this summer. And then the construction for this project is scheduled to begin spring-summer of 2019. Also, the $4 million downtown Curry Street project will include major utility and streetscape improvements from Musser to Robinson, and construction is already underway for this project. Um, Carson City's, oh, sorry. The fiscal year 2019 to 2023 pavement management plan was approved by the RTC at their April 11th meeting. And this plan establishes an efficient and effective strategy for preserving and maintaining the city's 676 lane miles of roadway. The plan establishes five performance districts and a five-year rotating schedule. And additional information um, on this plan can be found at the city's website under Public Works. On solid waste management, the city's consultant is compiling all the information that was discussed at the April 5th Board of Supervisors meeting, and they're developing a draft request for proposal, and that is expected to be presented to the board on June 21st. Also on May 21st, there's going to be a special meeting of the Utility Finance Oversight Committee, and this is to discuss refinancing higher interest rate bonds and using the debt service savings to finance a portion of the East-West Transmission Line project. And then lastly, the former Animal Services facility has been renovated for use as the Jack Operations Facility. And this is almost complete and they're expected to move in on June 1st. On to community development, the growth management will be discussed at the next planning commission meeting. That's on May 30th. And with those recommendations presented to the board in July. 
for permit building permit valuations. For April, it was 10.1 million for a year-to-date total of 26.5 million. That's 17 million for residential, 1.8 million for new commercial, and then 7.4 million in commercial remodel and miscellaneous. And this time last year, for the first four months, the permit valuation was 26.2 million. So we're just a little above that. For residential permits issued for the month of April, there were 24 single family, eight multifamily, and a manufactured home. This is a total of 81 residential permits issued for the first four months of the calendar year. And last year at this time, we were at 73. So this is the mixed-use commercial, commercial residential property on Curry Street. Loomis and Associates is expected to move into this building uh, this month. They're in. Are they in? <laughs> well, that's good. They made it in the month of May. <laughs> Something happened on time. And then permits are under review for a restaurant and additional offices. It's the lag time of the report. <laughs> The special use permit for the additional 70 units to the existing 310 unit apartment complex on Clearview was approved by the Planning Commission. It was actually on, that date should be April 25th. Some new permits, building permits that were submitted in April include Sierra Skies RV Park, Reno Lumber, and a car wash in North Carson. An addition for Pioneer High School. A cash and carry next to the Office Depot. And then the city's own wastewater resource recovery facility. Uh, other city updates, the alternative sentencing has four interns from WNC who started working in the office and the lab in April. This is a six month program where they will be working towards college credits. So this is a new item, IFC activity. So this is a recap of the internal finance committee activity from eight, April 4th to May 2nd. And any items that go to IFC that require a budget augmentation will be brought back to the board at the June 21st meeting. So these, these are just some of the things that were approved. We approved filling a vacant HR generalist. We approved recommending to the board the creation of a full-time associate planner position, and that was brought to the board May 3rd and approved. We approved an equity adjustment for a library assistant, and that's being funded through the library department salary savings. We approved a vacant sheriff support specialist, and also approved an equity adjustment for senior transportation planner. So the following were approved for funding from the undesignated funds in the capital projects fund sometimes called the break fix. <laughs> the first one is the concrete improvements at McFadden Splash Pad, $11,503. And this was to address safety concerns um, for slipping, yeah. Yeah. And the Charters of Freedom Monument <coughs> installation, uh, the foundation covered the monument and the city agreed to um, pay for the site preparation. And then a design study for the McFadden Plaza shade structure. This was 2,500. This is on the east side of the plaza by the fountain. And then also the replace, replacement of three damaged pedestrian bridges at Mills Park. This is $26,994. This was a safety concern. These bridges are worn out and they've already caused some injuries. So we want to replace those. And then um, general fund. 
to be paid from general fund contingency, we have on-track RDR recovery services. This was an emergency contract that we approved due to the email service outage that happened in December of 17. And then also purchased for Cisco Umbrella Secure Internet Gateway. That was $14,655. And that was a result of recent activity in the last month. So we approved the replacement of damaged shelving at the library for 5,900. This damage occurred during the library refresh that was done and um, they're, they're able to cover that from salary savings. And then we approve recommending to the board the Adams Hub lease and filling the bu business development manager position. And this also went to the board on May 3rd and was approved. That's it for the IFC. So this is, we thought we'd bring, um, after suggestion from Supervisor Bagwell, <laughs> the survey re results from Carson City Connect. and. So these are the results of the customer satisfaction surveys from April or January 1st, 2018 through May 8th. And there are 66 surveys that were filled out, which is a response rate of 50%. So in employee effectiveness, the we ranked 60, 67% ranked the city as superior and 24% were good, with only two uh, that were rated poor. Of course, we'd like that to be zero, but we'll work on it. <laughs> it's still good. Um, time to respond, 74% was superior and 17% was good, with only one poor. And then employee courtesy, 74% was superior and 18% good, and none were below average. And then for expectations met, 90% of the time we either met or exceeded expectations. So overall, I think these are pretty impressive ratings of the city. And um, we all know that we have hardworking, dedicated employees. And, and it looks like it's reflected with the public that they're also seeing that. So, so good job, all the departments and their employees. And that's it. Thank you, Nancy. Go ahead. So I, I really want to thank you for the uh, adding the IFC actions and the um, Carson City Connect. On the Connect one, can we add a component that tells us like the variation of what the issues were, like 40% on road issues, 20%, you know, what what the people are using Carson City Connect for. I'm very interested to see the types of issues being submitted. And thank you for a uh, very, very good report. Okay. We'll move on now to item number 17, non-action items. I just want to mention that uh, Shelley Ald former Supervisor Shelley Aldean, who is our representative on the TRPA, submitted her quarterly report, and it's part of our um, packet. And um, are there any other non-action items that need discussing? Yeah, I'd just like to take this opportunity, Nick, to say, you know, thank you for your service. It's been a pleasure working with you for the last four years. I wish that you weren't moving on uh, and maybe put you on the spot since you're not going to be at any more meetings. Are you ready to tell us what you're doing? I will on June 1st, but thank you. I Truly, from the bottom of my heart, I, I know I... I've already told you before, but I, I can't express to you in words how much I appreciate the opportunity you gave me, the support, guidance, and frankly, the friendship that all of you have given me. And I, I'm, I'm truly blessed. So thank you. I just want to echo what Brad said, and um, you've the management and how you've taken this on has brought it to a new level and I know Nancy will proceed in your footsteps. Thank you. I know she will too. I echo what those two have said. Okay, I have to come up with something different. We have too many dittos. Okay, um, and I guess how fortunate it is that Carson City will still have you here. And I know you'll do good. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate it. 
Okay. Um, any f other future ag agenda items anyone wants to bring forward for Nancy? <laughs> um, any status review of projects, internal communications, anything at all? Correspondence from the board. Okay. Um, any other public comment at this point in time? Seeing none, um, then we are going to recess until 1 o'clock and uh, be back for uh, planning commission interviews.